You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. We are back in our regular scheduled broadcasting time. Sorry for the delay with everything. We had a couple of last minute prompt to meetings with the old Department of Natural Resources of the Maryland. Then we had that holiday. So we should be good here going all the way forward. Thanks for everybody that joined the Patreon members tournament. This was our first dabble into that. And so far, it's going extremely well. People love the side pots, which is something that I honestly wish like the BFLs would do with snakeheads and things like that because it's just freaking fun to have those things available to you. So more of those will be coming in the future. This is going to be a hell of a show. Uh, We were talking backstage for for a long time and I completely lost track of it. So that's my fault. Uh, If everyone could hit that like button, it really helps us out, push this thing out there. Without further ado, the people that you really want to see, they rule the Friday nights. I hope they can get an alcohol sponsorship here soon because they need it. Bass and Beer Radio. (laughs) Guys, thank you so much to be back on here. Yeah, if anyone's watching as an alcohol sponsor, uh, we're taking all applications. Um, Tito's, Bud Light, Blue Moon, hit Mick, us up. Mick Ultra. I mean, look, I'm wearing a Pabst Blue Ribbon shirt just in case they're watching. You know? <laughs> so, if anyone out there. Oh, my we're gosh. Here. What's going on, man? We really appreciate you having us back. Thank um, you so much for having us, brother. No ra- no way I'd rather spend a Monday, that's for sure. Yeah. Nah, I do. the pleasure is mine. Um, you guys have been busy. I mean, really busy lately. Yeah, it's been full tournament mode for yeah. me, for Paul um you know riverboat robs we do we've had all kinds of stuff going on like my trailer fell apart on me twice riverboat robs on his second trailer this year if i'm not mistaken yeah um so everyone's just been got everyone's had their everything going on um we're finally getting a little bit back to normal with our schedule i know we, we've ended up missing a few friday nights just because people have tournaments on saturday morning and stuff like that so uh yeah we're we're it's or tournament on friday yeah, right. And we're we're settling in back back to normal, which is ironic because I don't fish more than I do in the fall. Um Yeah. I agree. So this your schedule's been insane with Oh yeah, I was out of the country go. twice in the last two months. I was on two different continents within didn't you thirty bring days. Back Dear God. Starvin Marvin. No. Okay. No, I did not. Is this an Ethiopian child or what? Yeah. <laughs> it would have been a Moroccan child. I was in Germany. Yeah. I was in I was in Germany in August. I got back on the twenty fourth of August and on September eighth I was on a plane to Morocco. So Dear God, it's been man. everywhere, bro. But it, Adam, it's good. what's up, it's good brother? Stuff. What is your guys' thought? Because I, mean, I want to first off, we're going to get a recap on one of, of your guys' year in review tournament-wise. It's that time of year where you can kind of, the dust is settled, you have a drink and just talk about how that went. But in general with the fall scheduling, why is it so many organizations, it seems like they have a, their head up their ass about where they go in the fall. Classic example, Kerr in, in September generally sucks balls compared to other places. To be fair, why- everything sucks balls in September. Yes, yeah, pretty, but it's like a, it's like you know lesser of two evils type of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think so. I think when we get later in the year, I think a lot of tournament organizations slow down in the fall because half of their target group or half their anglers are sitting in a tree. I think that yeah. has a lot to do with it. Like, yeah, I re- I remember when I was with Team Outcast, we wouldn't fish in November because everyone was like, "Oh, it's deer season." Like, I'm not fishing. I'm like, but that's when you want to go. Like that's the best time. Mm-hmm. To his, to his point, I mean, he's talking about like your championships. Yeah, so, it should you know, be later. So like the yeah. regional championship, you know, it's always in September. You know, whatever body of water it is, and September sucks. I mean, we had our oh, TBF, yeah. we had our TBF championship uh, in September on the Potomac, uh, and it took twelve pounds a day to win. So, yeah. you know, it's it's one of those things that you know just September fishing sucks. It, it's a terrible yeah. time to schedule your. Uh, to schedule your championships but on the other hand like obviously you have to have like your year and you have you know you're gonna have your championship at the end if you start scheduling it too far out then you're you know a lot of people don't want to travel because weather starts to play you know play a part so i, I just think like people will bitch no matter what so Always. pick what makes the weight like i think it was was it 2018 i think it was where they pushed kerr into like late October, November because of a hurricane. 
And the weights went up because oh, they did sure. that and they pushed it. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be better if you're BFL to have a higher sex sell because you can market, oh, it took 25 pounds to win. It would never do that occur through two days. But point is like the weights would go up. Wouldn't that be a better incentive for people to come down? I, I see for for those for like your BFL regional, I don't I don't think it matters as much where it is because the people that are fishing it are going to fish it anyway. Doesn't matter what time of year it is or where it's at because yeah, they fished all point. year. They fished all year to qualify for it. That's a good point. Um, you know, aside from the guys who are going to jump in, uh, you know, I know a lot of guys who will jump into like, you know, they'll look at the region where the regional is scheduled. And if the regional is on the Potomac, you know, they're, they'll go fish the BFLs that year because they know the regional is on the Potomac. So uh, outside of those guys, I think the guys who are traditionally fishing or year after year fishing the BFLs, it doesn't matter where the, you know, where the regional is. You're still going to have, you know, your 45 guys or whatever from each region or, you know, each region fishing that regional or each division fishing that regional. Should they mix it up or should it just uh, go to bugs for the next 30 years? <laughs> nice. Um, I, I mean, I like variety personally. It, I think I, they should mix it up. By mix it, by mix it up, you mean it's it's either Bugs Island or the Potomac every year, and it's. It, it, but if it's going to be like a be? smaller was field, on, yeah, was it, exactly, exactly. Could, could it be Lake Anna? Could it be Smith? I mean, like why? I think it was on Smith. I think it was on Smith one year. I mean, there's the, I don't know anything about Virginia, but like there's lots of opportunities. I mean, Philpot is big mm. enough to hold a regional tournament. Moomaw probably not. No. Uh, but I mean, Philpot you're looking, is. You're, like, yeah, regional. You're looking. I mean, you're looking at 150 boats. Okay, maybe Phil Pot isn't then. I don't know, Tom. Lake you Anna. Fish Phil Pot. Phil Pot's about three thousand to four thousand acres, but oh, the South is big enough oh, for that then. No. Yeah, but South Holston. Um, South Holston example. is five or six thousand acres, and it has a BFL every single year. Like. It, it, I really think it's context. I've had so many guys on from Ohio, Michigan. They're like, oh yeah, I fish Indian Lake with a 200 BF, 200 field BFL. And it's like a pond. If you grow up on the upper bay in the Potomac, it's literally like an inland lake. And I feel like you just get spoiled to size compared to what a lot of people get to do. And yeah, especially fish out of. in like Ohio, Illinois, like there are a lot of small lakes out there mm -hmm. in that, in that Midwest area. What about considering an, Maybe this is the same. I know this is part of the reason why the elite series go to the places they go. What about facilities, ramps? That's a, I mean, that's, that's, that's another thing too. Better because, argument. Yeah. Yeah. You got to have, you have to have the facilities to, right. to be able to handle 150 mm -hmm. boat tournament. I mean, if you don't, you end up with what you, what happened on the Mississippi. What happened? Mm -hmm. last week? Uh, 19 boaters left after the first day. Why? Mm -hmm. uh, because they moved the they had to move the launch site because there was some unexpected uh, construction on the ramp, so they moved the launch site. Uh, unexpected, quote unquote. Why did they? But why did the boaters just leave? They just like they were this? they were just pissed off. Unexpected construction. Well, really like I mean, how far did they move it? It was uh, fifty miles, I think. Oh, that's a big move. Yeah. That's a, yeah, that's a yeah. lot. Yeah, like that's, that's a not, huge move. It's not really just a little bop down the street. No, wow. Mm -hmm. That's like that's almost equivalent to go, almost equivalent to changing it from like Waddington to Clayton. Like that's a big. That's a lot. Like fifty miles on. It was fifty miles lot. by road. Like so, it could <laughs> have been. I think it was. I think it was on like the other side of the river. So I don't think it was like fifty miles. Oh, okay. I was thinking more linear because yeah. I mean, like from Clayton to, to Waddington on St. Lawrence is about fifty miles. Yeah. I don't. Um, I, I would have to look at a map to, to really figure that out. But um, apparently it was such a big clusterfuck at the ramp the first day that the 19 of the guys who didn't do that well were just like, yeah, screw it. I'm not coming. You know, I'm not coming for the second day. It's, What's not, left? it's not even worth it. So they ended up with uh, apparently they ended oh, up with uh, uh, a few, uh, you know, quite a few um, like double co-anglers in boats. Oh, that's so huh. three, three people in a boat. Three people Whatever. in a boat. Mm, I would leave. Boater and two co-anglers. I would leave. I would. I would. Oh no, this was it. after they left. Because and it was because they left. Because the you yeah, know, these no. guys left and just you know left these co-anglers. You know. Kind yeah, of I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, another I'm just like sour topic and another sour story for the co-anglers, man. I'm like. Yeah, what's your opinion on that? Because we oh, I got we, we talked about that, that a little while ago. Um, but like, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like, why? With in the age of, and I know I know where everyone individually stands on forward facing, but my question is: in the age of forward facing being a dominant technique now, especially in Highland reservoirs like Virginia, Bugs Island, stuff like that, where is the place for the co angler? Uh, it's not a forward facing sonar issue; it's a boater issue. It's okay. A, it's a boater attitude yeah. issue. 
Now, for, remind me of the rules. Is the boater allowed to say, "Hey, man, come on up on the front. Yeah. Let's cast to these fish." Can't fish. A, they can't fish from the front of the boat. But he could so tell you, him, land your bait next to mine. But if I, I've been with, I've been so perfect example. When I was in Texas this year, I was with a guy who was shallow water scoping, and he was fishing very shallow points that had one or two fish on them, um, and he was catching one or two fish off these points. Mm. and we did that the whole first first half of the day and like i wasn't i didn't catch i caught one fish behind him halfway through the day he he looks back says you got that carolina rig tied on i said yep he's like i'm gonna take you over here and to to a spot where you can catch some fish so he was scoping all day spent you know took me took me to a spot where i could throw a carolina rig for 20 minutes yeah i think we were there for 20 25 minutes you know i caught like seven seven fish there and they were, you know, I don't got two keepers out of it, but he, he took the time out of his day to make sure that his co-angler had an opportunity to catch fish. So what do you, you mean co-angler your, problem? Yeah, You pay well, your entry fees and whatnot to be on the back of his boat. And then he gives you 30 minutes out of the entire day for fishable water. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Well, he wasn't like I'm front ending. fine with that. He wasn't personally. like front ending me all day. Like I could still fish, right? It was just there were, you know, he. It was the second day of the tournament. He'd already caught fish off these points. There, there were just very few fish around. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did end up. I caught a three pounder behind him. Uh, that was big, you know, biggest fish that I caught all, you know, all week. But it, he, you know, he took the time out of his day to make sure not that I could fish, that I could catch fish. Mm -hmm. He had a spot. He knew a spot there that I would that I would be able to catch fish took 30 minutes out of what he was doing, you know, completely out of what he was doing, took me to the spot. We sat there for 25 minutes, bang, bang, bang. You know, I call, you know, I catch six fish there, you know, two of them, two of them measure. Uh, and then, you know, he went back to what he went back to what he was doing. Mm. That is to me, that's, that's how a boater should be. You need to give your co-angler an opportunity to catch fish. Right. Whether well, I mean, I you're scoping that, yeah. in the middle of the lake, if you're in a draw tournament, I almost feel like a boater is obligated to give their co-angler a chance to catch fish throughout the day if they're doing something that is fucking them. I, I mean, I agree with what you're saying. I do. What was the original question? <laughs> so with the the issue, <laughs> where, so, where what is the what is the co-angler's where where does the co-angler fit in now with forward facing and, sonar being such a and the reason I say that is because a lot of we've heard a lot this year from a lot of the local BFL and and. Our local BFL circuit is not even scope heavy, but like there was a thing yes, about the entry fees, like co anglers. So to have a link to avoid a boater on boater draw because there wasn't enough co anglers in some of the BFLs, they were co they were co anglers saying, "Hey, I'll sign up with you, but you got to pay my entry fee so you don't get screwed with a yep. boater on boater draw." Because co anglers well, are saying, "I'm not doing this because every time I fish and one I won't say his name, but you know who I'm talking about, one of the best sticks in this area, mm -hmm. who does very well." Uh, fishing BFLs as a co said he's not fishing as a co anymore because of this issue. You know, Toyota. He, yeah, that yeah, was Toyotas, but same thing. Well, kind of, but um, but the 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 crux of the issue is there's just not enough co's signing up because a lot of uh, there's a lot of frustration. I also feel like there's a big difference between Toyotas and BFLs. The yeah, problem I, I think is all stems, and th this is this is just my personal opinion tangent. A lot of this stems back from FLW FLW days and the FLW changing the terminology from boater co angler to pro and amateur. Hmm. There, I do remember that actually. You were, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. If you were a pro, you were a boater. And if you were an amateur, in, you were a rider. I, yep. To me, it feeds into people's egos. And makes them think that they're doing something that they're not. It's a BFL. It's a 150 boat club tournament. It doesn't pay out for shit. If you win and you own a Phoenix boat, you, you'll get a good payout. Um, yeah. You know, go buy a Phoenix. I, if not, I th yeah. it's, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a grassroots level. It's and a grassroots the, level thing. It is. And the people who fish it, or I'm not saying all of the people that fish it, but a quite a few people that fish it think they are professional fishermen and mm -hmm. they act that way. And that has really hurt the uh the co-angler field because they don't give a shit about the co-angler. 
They are out there for themselves. They have a very selfish attitude about it. And that they're going to go out and they're going to catch their their fish, co-angler be damned. And, and, and the original no, thing was there's not enough boaters signing up? Or is that what you're saying? Not, not enough no, co-anglers. co-anglers. Be, it's co-anglers. Yeah. I think it's a multi-pronged thing. I think it's the economy, which no corporation will ever tell you anything besides it's doing great, which is a lie. Uh, on the BassCast Radio, we went through that they went from eight BFL divisions in 2000 to five or four next year. Like, it's insane how much they keep cutting it down. They changed the All-American. more travel for the guys that are going to fish them. More travel. And and they blamed they blamed everything in the world, but the, but the, what they didn't say in the in the press release is the economy, which is why it, it it's shit. Payouts are shit. It's you like know the half South these pro- it, <laughs> half these problems. <laughs> if if they actually paid out like ten sport. grand, yeah, exactly. It's a and rich man sport. Well, depending yeah, on the area you, you live in, kayaking gonna, is taking over. You're not going to make. Yeah. A, it I is. mean, it's, it, it is. Unless yeah. you win a BFL, you are not going to make money in a BFL season. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like you have to win at least one tournament to make money in a BFL season. Well, you're, you're including like hotels, gas, all that stuff. Yeah. Right? yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which, travel yeah, expenses, because especially around here, like it's not like, you know, some of the, wow, that was terrible. Um, your dog sucks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did he let one rip? Yeah. So nice. it. it's not like we have, um, you know, uh, some of the, some of the BFL divisions, like if you look at like, uh, Texas, I think there's a BFL division that fish that only fishes Rayburn and Toledo Bend. They're 30 minutes apart. Mm. You know, the Northeast BFLs go from the Potomac to Champlain. It's, it's not it, it, that was something that I am pissed about because in 2020 they had an Eastern division, which was like Lake Norman, Hartwell. Uh, I think it was like Bug, or the Potomac. But then you call the Northeast and you go from the Canadian border to D.C. Like, how the hell? That's half of the eastern seaboard. Like, that's not doable. The northern part of the eastern seaboard. I mean, that that is true. Yeah, (laughs) technically. But But our our area is so freaking we drive so much. I mean, if you live in D.C. or work in D.C. up here, like we are used to commuting. It's insane. But, you know, it's the travel expenses like just Mm -hmm. going, uh, you know, when I when I went to New York uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I mean, it was a thousand dollars in fuel between the truck, my, my truck and the boat. Good lord! I mean, you that's know, that's not counting lodging. Went out of Florida two years ago, and it was it, it, oh it my was, god! So the funny story yeah, about that trip, freaking nuts. So when we drove down to Florida, me and my my partner, we just basically decided we would split fuel for the boat down the middle, and he would pay for the fuel down. I would pay for the fuel back. Well, the fuel on the way down was a dollar cheaper than the fuel on the way back <laughs> because that was like we were coming back like three days after the Ukraine invasion happened and everything skyrocketed. That was when gas got to like five dollars a gallon. Was that then mm-hmm. or was that when on the uh, Texas had that freeze? Uh, I, it was in oh, 2022. Yeah. So I think it's it was a, it was the freeze. Was it? it? Yeah. Yeah. Either because way, that happened, we were in Texas. We were in Texas. And uh, the gas prices like went up astronomically on our way like home. overnight. Like yeah. it was, it was. A, I mean, a deal's a deal. I said I'll, I'll pay for it on the way home, and it was like, oh my god. But travel expenses are. I mean, travel expenses in our BFL region. It's not. It's not worth fishing the BFLs. No, it's it's not. And, and, and I've off. always. Um. So no, no. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you're, you. But, oh, you're good. You're good. Um. Doing the math. Between travel expenses and there being five BFL tournaments, it only costs about. Uh, I think I figured it up to be it's it's only about uh, I think six hundred dollars more six hundred dollars more to fish the Toyota series. Jeez. And you have a chance of winning fifty grand instead of. So educate it, me know, on that. A couple thousand I heard if you win a Toyota series like tournament, you get a boat. Is that true? Kalangers, yeah. If you win a tournament, a tournament, you get a boat. Every Toyota mm-hmm. series gives away a uh, eighteen, an eighteen, or it's an eighteen foot Phoenix with a one fifteen. Dude, why am I not fishing that as a co angler? But but again, because you don't want an eighteen foot Phoenix with a one fifteen. Yeah, I do. Plus, I sell it. But hey, but plus, look, think about where we are. If you live at Toledo Bend and you go bouncing back and forth, or that Toyota series, like you don't have to commute as far as if you're here. What are you no. going to do? Drive up to Canada two times? Like it, it's insane. I mean, where are the uh, so the Toyotas this year were uh, Saint Lawrence, Saint Potomac, Lawrence, Potomac, and what Oneida. I think it was Oneida. Oneida yeah, it was Oneida. Kanuga, one of the two. One of the, oh, yeah. I thought they were. I thought they were closer. I thought it was more localized than that. No. Oh. It's, okay. Potom- it's going to be Potomac. It's Potomac, and then usually two New York tournaments. Mm-hmm. 
But still, it's, insane. it's cheaper to fish, or it's not much more expensive to fish those as a boater. And that's paying the boater entry fees, which are $1,800 a tournament. It's not that much more expensive to fish those than it is to fish five BFLs. Jesus, what's the opens? Uh, For they're up to five 2, grand? Now. Is it 2,000? 2,000. 2,000 a tournament now. Wow. And then to fish a Hobie, it costs $250. <laughs> guaranteed $10,000 payback if they have 150 kayak draw. And then you fish two full days and you don't have to fill up your boat. That's, I mean, that's a good deal. And I mean, yeah, that's it, so if that's, the organization will, if, the, if, if you want to talk about going into the whole kayak thing, then yeah, it's, it's so much well, more. I will it, tell you, and the money is there. Yeah, it's just, I think what has to happen because I try to, I talk about both industries is that they have to acknowledge the presence of kayaking and what it's doing, and they won't. Yeah. It's the same thing with forward facing sonar. That whole argument, they were using that as leverage to get people to bitch about the co-angling thing, which do I think it's part of it? Absolutely. Do I think it's the whole thing? No, your payouts are shit. If it was $10,000 to the winner each time you had a BFL, you would have a shit ton of boaters pull in. Let's just be honest about it. Oh, I mean, yeah. you know, $20 is $20. 200 bucks, to, you know, $200 tournament, $10,000 guaranteed. Hell yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. if the payouts were better, there would be less bitching because it just seems like most of the co-angling drama is the Toyota and the BFL. When I talk about the local groups, it's just it, you don't have the same drama around it as it is specifically no. the isolation that are the BFLs. No, never. The, Which the means. Is, so yeah. the, the, the funny you're, you're talking about tournaments and payouts. So uh, ABA had their pro series or their pro series this year, which was a co-angler free if that organization didn't suck so much god that would be such a good it would be such a good a trail to fish uh yeah i, I mean it's I, ten thousand it's three hundred dollars to fish uh if 200 boats is ten thousand you know it's ten thousand dollars for first uh they draw that many boats there's no cooling no that's the problem mm. because they're not, that used to be the ram series right aba ram series yeah. now it's the whatever it's not ran very well um, so they, they don't pull the boats and next year they went back to four tournaments on the Potomac and, you know, they're going to have 20 boats like they did the last time they did, you know, four tournaments on the Potomac. And so it's just not ran correctly. It, <laughs> it, it's just not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but hey. that's, that's correct, man. Money talks and I, they're, they're bleeding the BFLs to death and I don't, especially when you look at how much they've shrunk the Toyotas and the BFLs when it comes to how many series they've run. I mean, completely just saying pissing off the West Coast. And I get it, you don't have the draw, but it's more of like you had the presence out there forever and you did nothing with it. And so what is going on here? Why are you catering to the 1%? And honestly, I feel like they just don't feel like they ha they they don't care. They truly don't care. The Federation is not what it used to be. The BFLs aren't what they used to be. You have more of these regionals with CAT and then like the Virginia Elite 70 where I'm at in Virginia. Uh, Texas has a shit ton of local groups that are really good payouts. Elite 70 is oh, yeah. huge. I mean, you have Potomac Elite 70 is huge. Uh, Potomac, Potomac team, teams, yeah. Is ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, they draw, what, 70, 75 boats? Yeah. Hard hitters, too. Yeah. And hammers. <laughs> All mm -hmm. of them. <laughs> I mean, straight hammers. Yeah. I, a, couple, a couple of my friends. I um, won't fish Potomac teams. We'll put it that way. A couple of buddies of mine uh, that I fished with in VMI, they actually did very, very well in the Elite 70 this year. So, oh, right cool. on. Um, they're both absolute monsters. They're, they can fish. It's funny, though, because they both of them, they're brothers. They both hate the Potomac because they're like, this grass thing, dude, what the hell is this? <laughs> and I'm like, yep, you guys, that's your throwaway. But, like, they'll go. I mean, uh, they were fishing uh, one of. After they, they're in like the top twenty every tournament, like easily. They were in. I think my one buddy Wyatt and his partner were like fourth in the year until the last tournament, and they had a bad tournament. They dropped to like ninth or something. That's good. So that's yeah. And, and then I mean, there's some like Jacob some Peroznik hammer. fishes the hammers. elite seventies. Like Wu Davis fishes the elite seventy. Like there's some good sticks. It's not even the the big names that you really have to worry about in those. Mm -mm. <laughs> it, it, it's the, it's guys just the people at the time <laughs> right yeah it's those guys in that john boat it's it's not the guys in the john boat it's just the guys that well, they literally they fish three bodies of water f for the last 20 years yep. like yeah. that's all they've fished is just the potomac and lake anna for you know the pit last 25 well years. it's like it's, it's the like guys in the john boat because they can't go anywhere else it's like compare a club <laughs> compare any club tournament on conlingo to any of the opens 
Like it's, it's the difference that it takes to win is usually a double digit difference, which What's is up, insane. Up, Tracy, I mean, my club or the there were club tournaments going on, and it took nine pounds to win the same day. Somebody caught and won a tournament with eighteen pounds. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this this is, yeah. I think this kind of summarizes the uh, the thing for me out of all that you gentlemen are talking about is the conversation ends at what you said about it takes money to make money, and I, it, it's just I. I they have the ability if they wanted to throw more money. I think it was I think it was Forrest Wood that he wanted to make he whipped his dick out and said, like, yeah, we're gonna make a million dollars for the cup because he just wanted to like blow bass out of the water when he did that. And I don't think bass ever matched that payout. Never. And and again, we can say, like, oh, there's other factors there, but no, he did it for the precedent of like this is what we're gonna do. They could do that with the BFLs. And and we had this happen with that third organization that popped up to put a little pressure on the BPT and Bass. Will there be an organization that puts pressure and says like, yeah, let's just try to make a grassroots organization that actually pays out well? Because if that happens, the BFLs are gone tomorrow. If any Man, organization gave them pressure. I don't, I don't think I don't think so. Um, Do you think they stay economically it's the, viable? It's the it's the dangling of the carrot. Oh, well, if you make it, you know, if you make the, uh, you know, if you make the all American, you win the all American, then you go to the Toyota series. And if you, you know, if you win the Toyota series championship, mm-hmm. that's, you know, that's, you know, $125,000. There's always somewhere to, you know, they have this carrot that are dangling of the ability to move up to another, uh, another tour, right? You know, you win the Toyota series championship. Oh, well, now you can fish the tackle warehouse invitationals. Yeah, there's always that carrot, and so many people are following that carrot, and that's you know it's the it's the same thing with BASS. I mean, that's why you have you know the the nation is still around is because oh well you know you got the nation championship and you can I can fish in the Bassmaster Classic. Uh, if you don't have that with other organizations, like if you look at like the ABA, um, I mean the ABA has a hundred thousand dollar championship. They still you know, some, you know, some regions do better than others, but, you know, here I've, I've never seen one and I fished them quite a bit um, until the last few years. We've never, you know, never had a hundred boats, you know, and to make the championship is not that hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, you have to finish in like the top, you know, like the top 10 in points or something like that. Like it's not, it's not super hard, you know, the top 10 in points out of a, you know, 50 boat field, not that, you know, not, not that hard. Um, yeah, the, but maybe oversaturation is a problem too. oversaturation, in the economy being crap where you can't fish them all. And to be fair though, like a lot of these issues really are, they still existed prior to the economy really going downhill. Mm, I agree with that. I don't know. It kind of, it, it sounds like there's a lot of options and none of them are great. That's that's the thing. It's I feel like if you take the I want to take the BFLs because that's really truly the only grassroots tour anymore. Tour, well, I'll say tour. A uh, trip mm-hmm. to me, like just looking at like entry fees. Like I did, I I did some math one day on, on like the amount of money that they make on entry fees throughout the year, and you know it's an astronomical amount of money. I mean, you're, we're talking millions of dollars yep. that they're that they're bringing in, and then you do Jacob Wheeler's expensive. Then you look at yeah, the, right. exactly, and then you look at the payouts for you know you t- you take the average payouts for all the BFLs, and you know it ends up you know it ends up being like counting, and, and it, because there's you know entry fees into the regionals now, so used that used to be free, but. You know, there's a very large sum of money that you used that they're using to fund their other stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like, I mean, I get it. Like, you know, you're paying out a hundred thousand dollars to all American. You're, you, you know, you're doing all this stuff, but there's still a, you're still using that trail to fund your company. And I get it. Like it, it's a business, right? They got to make money. I think it was better for them when they had more of a monopoly on it than they do now. And, and again, so I think that's interesting to see as this this as this ball gets pushed forward, and if uh, if other organizations start trying to create their own filter system, does that start taking away from it? You have so many local. Again, there's more regional things. I mean, again, I, um, uh, not Marin Marine. God damn it, 
SB is sponsored by them, whatever that freaking place is. They don't sponsor me, so I don't care if I mess up their name. I mean, they're running a <laughs> tournament trail down there at like Lake Norman. Cat's Angler's running Choice. one. Angler's, Angler's, Angler's Choice. Choice, thank you. Yep. If if everyone and their brother starts, this is way more local trails than I remember when I was a kid. Like it was pretty much it was the BFLs and maybe some like you know, twenty man clubs. Bass Nation uh, Bass, Bass Nation State yeah. State Trails. Yeah, that's it. That was it, yeah. There's so much and more I, local. Like you said, yeah, you're right yeah. on so much more local stuff that people who you know, they get fed up with the BS from the BFLs. They're like, well, why am I, you know, I spend all this money to travel. I actually know some, uh, I have, uh, uh, you know, a couple of friends that decided to stop fishing the BFLs and they just fished. Um, there was a, I, I don't know if it's still around, but there was a Potomac uh, trail that was, it was a thousand dollar entry fee uh, for a few years. And they're, mm -hmm. you know, they decided to fish that because, well, it pays out better, and by the time we talk about expenses and everything, well, I was paying as much in expenses as it is to fish this tournament, period. So if I just don't fish the BFLs, I'm spending the same amount of money, and I got a chance to win twenty grand. And it, you know, I think the first prize in the tournament was twenty grand. So it, why you know, would you have a lot of people? You know, uh, stuff like that takes away. You know, takes away from takes away from those other trails. Uh, you know, those crappy trails. We got Scott. Uh, they keep blowing smoke up your ass, and guys keep going back. I don't understand how you keep believing the lie. They keep telling you next year will be better. Uh, you, yeah, it sounds like. Are you talking about fishing or bad relationship? My God, uh, <laughs> with the like same a, old like schedule, both. Party. It's both. <laughs> it's really. I mean, it really is both. And again, it, he's right on the money though. Like every. Why is it that everything and like not? But just keep it strictly fishing here. But like. <laughs> Why is it that everything is oh next year it'll be so much better? And it's just like I will say, at least with the Maryland Bass Nation, um, and I don't fish Maryland Bass Nation, I would really I like to. I will fix all this if yeah. you elect me. Well, at least with the Maryland Bass Nation, they're very open about the directions they're thinking about going next year, and they actually made a change to make it team tournaments for the state stuff. They listened to their folks, and I had I Did fished a hand. I Did think they? I kind of I mean they tried something different. They were having nobody for the SQTs. <laughs> phase, bro. So, I mean, it's, an, it's a brand new tournament director, it, and he's was, already made changes, which I, I think he's not going to be a tournament director next year. Well, who, who's the new guy that they just brought in? Damn. That was Tom. He's not going to be tournament director next year because he wants to fish. Uh, it's too much. To, it's too much to be tournament director and fish. Really? Yeah. No shit. It's a nightmare. But it's a nightmare. My, my point was they put out this whole. But thing. it wasn't the tournament director that did that. That was the tournament committee. Okay. Um, but at least they did that. something. But you know, they had just as many people that were opposed to the team format as they were that was with it. Now, to, for me, I think the team selfishly, I think the team idea is great because now when I go out and fish, I don't have to show some Yahoo every place that I fish on the upper bay. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, I like the team. Like format. You, I always have that inkling. And whenever I fish a draw tournament on the upper bay, I have that that little like voice in the back of my head that says like, don't go to the, don't go to the spot. Like, you know, he tells everyone <laughs> and you know, so do you really want to burn that good spot for like a state qualifier tournament or something like that? You know, or are you just fish maybe a okay. series that doesn't have a co-angler? Right. Or a team series, like, like or a team series. Matches. So I'm fine with the team series. <laughs> um, We'll see how we it, got uh, we'll see how it on goes. Instagram. We got Joshua, Joshua, twenty eight, eight, six. I'm not crazy about the team's format for MD Bass. It, it's a neat experiment. Let's just see what happens with it. It. Yeah, that that's going to be an interesting format. I mean, speaking of the Federation, though, is that Josh um, Torres by chance? Yeah. Yeah. Josh Torres. I just I just just saw him uh, last week. He was also Let's, fishing the state championship. Down well, the that's a hell of a segue the then. So <laughs> your series. Uh, I'm good. It's the last one, so if you want it. No, I'm good. Okay. I'm like three quarters. Don't mind if I do. Uh, sorry. So, about that. no, you're good. Um, yeah, I mean, you're in review. You just came back from a state championship. Uh, yeah. What was it for? Uh, so, that was the, the Maryland Bass Nation uh, state championship. Uh, so, that decides, you know, which members of the Maryland Bass Nation qualify to fish the Bass Nation championship, um, you know, with the chance to fish for the classic and the elite series and all that fun stuff. Um, so, that uh i qualified i did not fish the trail this year i qualified through the mr bass tournament which is like the you know the, like the club championship um but yeah year in review uh it, this year's went pretty well for me can't com yeah, can't really complain except for the money tournaments i've sucked in every money tournament i've fished well how did the state go then um so i ended i ended up 
uh, it was on the it was on the Pocomo River, uh, you know, down in Snow Hill, down in uh, down in the south part of the shore. Um, while while he's on here, big big shout out to uh, Scott Dice for getting my trolling motor fixed uh, prior to that tournament. So uh, he. I took my huge shout out, Scott. I, I was a uh, yeah. past PA disc president. I ran a tournament, et cetera. And I hear it through the shop. Control your cost, fish, local, high draw, high payouts, only have more yep. fun. And it's less BS. hundred percent, Scott. hundred percent. So but, uh, yeah, uh, back to it. Yeah. So back to it. So state championship, um, went down there on Sunday. I've never been to the Pocomoke river before in my life. Um, did four days of, of practice, four days of practice, a lot of, lot of looking around, a lot of, a lot of scanning, um, kind of figured, you know, kind of figured, figured out where some fish were located and ended up, uh, ended up winning the tournament. So 10 of the, that would be, you know, that's pretty much 10 of the, uh, you know, best fishermen in the Bass Nation, uh, that qualify for that. It's 10 boaters, 10 riders. Uh, so kind of the, the 10 best and ended up winning against some absolute hammers. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a good time. Is there anything that you would tell yourself before you started that event? Any advice you'd give yourself? Uh, don't have any preconceived notions. So was that place hard to figure out? This skinny ass river is where you were. Yes. Uh, and, uh, Brian, I like that idea. It fishes, it fishes like every other tidal river. Uh, it's just, uh, it's a, it's a little different. Um, if you're familiar with the shore rivers, it, it fishes pretty similar, uh, except there's a lot of cypress stumps. That Creek that was right there is where I caught all my fish the first day. This one? Yeah. Um, how, not far, so long ago. how far up did you go to the bridge? Okay. Right mm-hmm. I didn't go into the bridge. The tide was too high for me to get into the bridge in practice. So I didn't bother going up there in the tournament. Um, so no, it, it, yeah, it fishes. So it fishes a lot like most of the shore rivers. You know, it's deep in the middle. You know, shallow wood on the sides. Uh, the biggest difference is there's a lot of cypress stumps. So um, that is a you know that's a that's a key piece of structure down there. Is, you know, finding the stru- cypress stumps. If you ever seen cypress trees, you know they have all the knees. Um, so you know it kind of creates a, a a cool little place. Um, but yeah, just not having any preconceived notions, just going down and figuring it out. Like, you know, don't listen to doc talk. Um, I tried not to get, you know, too much information beforehand. Um, you know, my, my best friend gave me who grew up on the shore, you know, told me, you know, gave me some areas to check out. Um, you know, said, you know, check some of the, you know, check some of these areas out. But that was, that so was it. Was, uh, it, it was, wasn't more it was of a back, Tom, back to the go uh, back up. Not so long ago creek. See that creek right there? This one right here, yeah, that's yep. that's where I caught all my. That's where I dude, you could throw a baseball there. across this thing. Oh, that creek, you one hundred percent could. That's pretty that's cool. I mean, that, that creek, uh, so that creek is so, probably fifty yards wide. I feel like it's just a very Jeez. interesting fishery because of like how it's like a very long but narrow. Yeah, it, it's a lot like I mean, like I said, it's a lot <laughs> like the other shore rivers. So mm-hmm. it's a lot like the chop tank. Um, Chop tank, Nanticoke, wow. you know, they're narrow. Nanticoke's a little wider than the, like the chop tank, but, um, Chickamacomico. Yeah. It, it's just, they're narrow, deep, narrow, deep rivers, you know, big, big, pretty big tide swings. And I, I don't know if you, if you can fish a shore, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't hard to fish, uh, or hard to figure out. And it's just loaded with fish. It, it, it's interesting. You say that cause something that came up, um, in, I forget which stream it was, which is, is it harder to be dropped into a random tidal river without experience or a random lake? And I argued that tidal river by far. a Got tidal it. river is harder, even if you have even if you have experience on let's say the Potomac, you can't go to the Delaware and automatically catch them because it's so they set up at certain places at certain tides versus a lake. You can at least graph a point, see fish, and come back and guts and nuts it there versus these places where the tide moves, that that place might be dry. So you especially don't know. in a place like the Delaware. So the biggest, the biggest yeah. thing I will say, it's always, it's probably always easier to. I mean, I, the, all I fish is tidal water, so for the most part. Okay, fair enough. Uh, ninety, you know, ninety percent. I, I love fishing lakes. Um, I just, you know, uh, what's I live, up, little Bradley? I live on the gunpowder, so like I fish tidal water all the time. But um, so for me, it's not real hard to figure out tidal water, but. As far as it being easier, it's way easier to figure out a league. Oh, snap. Here's the... Totally forgot the Ravens game was tonight. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> uh, so the biggest thing I feel like 
you know, with making a lake easier <laughs> is because you have patterns and it's not like tidal water where the fish only eat for an hour and a half. And that might be mm -hmm. at three o'clock in the afternoon or it might be six o'clock in the morning. That's when they eat. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, you get that a lot on, especially on the shore rivers, you know, very specific tides that they eat on. So I would say, you know, you throw me in a random lake, uh, I'm going to do uh, I'm going to do better on a random lake than a random than random tidal water because there's just so much more variables in tidal. How did you keep it simple then for this event? Because you've never been there before. It's going to be ripping. Did you say I completely blacked out? Did you have a lot of practice or none? Um, so I went down the tournament was Thursday and Friday. I went down on Sunday, so I practiced for four days. OK, OK, so you had some time so there, so I, that kind of narrowed it down. Pretty, pretty good pretty good idea um I, I mean really keeping it i just kept it with my confidence you know my my tidal water confidence baits right um you know stuff that i know you know is that just works on tidal water you know your spinner baits your crank baits cover all i i covered a ton of water in practice um that was I, if you look at that map i probably covered just about every shoreline from snow hill to pocomoke city mm. um for the you know a large majority of it um just covering water trying you know trying to trying to get some bites um again not getting too not getting fancy with it um i did on the on the third day of practice i, I did try some some different things that i thought um i might be able to get some some better bites on um i was i threw a jerk bait um I, I did throw at the Miki rig a little bit um, just to try to, just because of how the fish were positioned. Um, Cause there's a lot of 30 foot holes on that river. I mean, it, eight foot. I mean, uh, there were, you know, a lot of, a lot of wood in like eight foot and the way that they were positioned on it, I was like, eh, I could probably catch them on the Miki rig here and well, they wouldn't need it. I, I got three or four to come out. Uh, they, they would come out and, and follow it, but they, you know, it just, they wouldn't need it. And, if I had more time to play around with it, I, pr I probably could have figured that out. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I just kept it simple with my confidence baits. I mean, it, it's tidal water. You know, it, it doesn't matter if you're on the Potomac, Upper Bay, Chop <laughs> Tank, Pocomoke. Your basic baits work. You know, Sen Senko, Square Bill, and Spinner Bait, right? Was that Jim mm -hmm. says no swim baits? Uh, not unless they were on the back of my uh, Spinner Bait as a trailer. Yeah, that's the only swim baits that, that got thrown. <laughs> Ooh, I got a good question here on Instagram. Uh, what's a better tidal water bait, drop shot or shaky head? Shaky head. It's not close. Shaky head. It's not close. Depends on what you're fishing. Every uh, every bait. Look at him going with the intellectual answer. <laughs> every bait has its use. Okay, so uh, on, yeah. I, I if will I'm honor. Fishing, the, if I'm fishing, you're, you're, if you're yeah. if you're fishing docks, drop shot. I disagree 100%. vehemently if you're fishing docks. If you're fishing docks, drop shot. I, I guarantee you that I've caught more fish off of docks with a drop shot than you've ever caught on tidal water with a shaky head. But big pick ones. one. Big <laughs> For the rest of your life on the river, pick one. Drop shaky, shot or shaky, shaky head. head. For the shaky rest head. of my drop shot. Yep. Shaky drop head. shot. Ooh. Now, when 100%. I say a J, when I say shaky head, I'm not talking about a shaky head on the spinning rod. I'm throwing a big, big shaky head. Your power. Almost You're like a jig. Throwing a power shake. It's head. a. I mean, you know, you've seen me throw. You know yeah. what I throw. It's almost like a jig like at a that point. Half ounce shaky head weight. Right. It's like or more. Big magnum worm. Or right. I'm. I'm throwing a, a big. You know, a yeah. pretty big bait. But I will say that bite. But he completely, won't throw a glide bait. But that bait dies. <laughs> I mean, that bite dies after like end of June. You're not catching them on that shaky head anymore. So to Paul's point, the drop shot is definitely more versatile. Well, it's the same. You're throwing it. You're essentially throwing it the same time, the same time of year that I'm throwing a big worm. When I'm throwing, you know, when I'm throwing a 12 inch worm, it's just that post spawn period. They eat it for you know three weeks and then they die. And then it's all. Yeah. Well, I don't know because I the, the tournament that I won in the gunpowder when I had like 18 pounds, that was all on the shaky head. And they were spawn. That was spawn. Yeah, those were spawn fish. Yeah. They were bed fishing. So to me, that that bait really shines. Were you throwing the spawn. that big shaky head? The giant yeah. one. Yep, the giant one. Yep. At that point, but again, first I, time but I it does. That's, that's one of like, what. The that's one of those things, though. This? Like it might, it may not have really mattered what you were throwing that day. Too. It's possible, you know? but I, but I'm telling you, like every, the size of my finger. For whatever for whatever reason, <laughs> it's just a magnum for worm. It's once once April hits, and I've caught them on the Potomac on that too. But like April to. 
at the latest end of June. Like that, if I come across a piece of hard structure, I'm picking that thing up and I'm throwing it in there. Like on 17 pound test, like if he bites it, he's in the boat. Like I'm not, I, I would I rather how much take less bites. So, but with a, so just to explain, so I can catch fish on a drop shot. Year round. Literally 12 months out of the year. You, yes, you can. 100%. On title. That's true. Yep. Like I, I, I won't even argue that because it's true. It's 100%. I can catch them out of the grass. I can catch them off hardcover. I can catch them mm-hmm. in lay downs. Like I can, I can fish it anywhere and it just, it works. Yeah. I've never thrown a drop shot once in my life. It's crazy. You, you got to go fish with me. You are missing out. Um, because he throws big swim baits. True. So with that said, you're up next. How'd your gear go with you saying I throw a drop shot? My year? Oh, my yeah. year's been terrible. It's been absolutely awful. <laughs> <laughs> it's, been, it's been the worst year of fishing of my entire existence. At least you can laugh about it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Between, you know, between just personal shit going on, so not having the... Uh, drive to go out and fish as much and then when i do go out and fish snapping off my 200 hundred dollar baits and watching them sink to the bottom oh, of this. Um, Jeez, and then when i do get a bite it's like you know what it's like you know when you always like go out and you throw a big bait you get a hit on it you're like oh fuck yeah you're like yeah a big one like it's gonna be a big one that's uh, a pound and a half and you know what? And <laughs> the thing is, the thing is mm-hmm. too is like they hit the big bait and you're throwing the big rod and you can load up on a pound and a half. It still feels like a big fish, though. So, like, you're, like, dragging it through the water, and you're like, oh, it's going to be a nice one. And it comes up, and it's like a two-pounder that's the size of the bait. And that's just pretty much been my story all season. What would you do different, looking back on it? Tie a different knot. <laughs> <laughs> What knot are you tying? <laughs> well, all right. So let me rephrase this. I would retie. So I was been tying the Palomar. Love the Palomar. And then I went to the San Diego Jam. I was throwing the San Diego Jam and it freaking clean broke right at the base of the knot. I got the whole knot back where it broke off at. I've never had that problem with the Palomar, though. The, the Palomar okay. always breaks clean above the knot, so yeah. it's not anymore. <laughs> dude, dude, you come back with you that, got, just that little yeah. curl. Yeah. <laughs> Every time you catch one, just cut and retie. You got to get almost autism with that in good tournaments, just get in that habit. I know. it's like I, I don't even do that. I I dude. Do. But I, I'm I very... Can't do any, I have, I'm not going to sit... I've never sat on this on the internet. I've never lied to anybody on here. If I told you guys I didn't lose some of my baits after I pulled it out of five different trees, I would be lying to you. But I <laughs> I'm very, um, I'm very cognizant of checking my line, though. Um, I'm, oh, Jim, you know, I will, I will check it, and I will, and I will, and I will I, I, you know, I will retie every, every, you know, every couple of fish, or if I, you know, if I catch a big one, like it, I'm retying, but. I, I don't retie nearly as often as I should. Yes, yeah, like what what are you doing? Because like um, you know, when I'm up here on fishing tournaments on the Upper Potomac, uh, where we're catching, like we just had our Antietam Bassmasters event up on Big Slack, and it's four pound, five pound test for smallmouth. And yeah, I would be lying to you that if I don't, you got to feel it oh, yeah. to make sure because they get their lips on that. It's not going to last, yeah, especially this time sure. of year. Especially, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's- I'm more likely to retie if I'm when I'm fishing a lighter line. If I'm fishing like six pound line, it, like I'm going to retie, you know, six pound line on Ontario catching four pounders. Yeah. Like I'm retying just about every fish. Well, this if, weekend, if I'm throwing my mortgage like he is every cast, I'm checking the line a couple of times. These guys, if these guys are out throwing these baits and they're retying every two, three bites or every. One or two tree snags. We can't say the. It's like once every three. It's like once every three days, anyway. So it's like. Well, I'm just saying. Like, I can understand why. Like, I'm looking back at it now. I'm like, we're doing that. You're not going to have any line left on your spool at the end of the day, after you just continually. I mean, retire and retire. Oh, so if you're trying to San just, Diego, if you're trying to San Diego jam, you're not using any more line on a big bait than mm-hmm. you are on like, not so a, much like the, a spinner bait. The Palomar, I always have a nice. Oh, Palomar, because you got to get that big loop around that <laughs> nine inch bait. <laughs> it's like um, trying to tie a oh, Palomar on a. But Alabama that was the reef. confidence not for a long time, so it was like I don't want to retie because <clears> I'm like I always have backing on my reels too. So then I'm running twenty pound. Yep fluoro on my on my backing which jim is telling me to get rid of i guess i gotta go to braid and 
I'm freaking getting down to that knot. Like, I'm freaking throwing it out there, and I'm feeling the knot start cutting a hole in my thumb. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that's I'm like, I'm like man, like, I don't want to retie <clears throat> again because I'm going to lose another foot. I stopped. I stopped <laughs> See, Jim Jim knows where it's at. Uni knot. Yep. I, I use the I uh, doing that. I use the double line uni knot. That's that's my favorite knot. I what is everyone's favorite knot, knot? knot? The uni knot with a 20 pound FG. fluorocarbon is still Ooh. a thick knot. Oh, the FG is the, FG's the one. That's the only knot you need to for braid the leaders. The FG. Period. End of sentence. Stamp FG. it. Mm-hmm. Take it FG. to the bank. You don't. You don't use leaders. <laughs> I get passionate about uh, the I FG only, I only use leaders on my spinning rods. <laughs> what would not be used? What's your, what's your go-to? Uni, uni. Uni, double uni. Double I uni. use that for years. Ooh. Uni, uni. uni. I like the uni, uni. It's not, it has not failed me very often. My failing points is always my laziness because I don't retie. My biggest mm-hmm. problem with the, with the uni, the uni, the uni. And leaders get, are weak points. You're 100% right, Jim. If you yeah. get snagged. <clears throat> leaders are a, a weak point. Or for me anyway, with with a uni to uni, if I like got snagged and like say I'm throwing a shaky head, get wedged in the rocks. If I if you I go to break it, if I go to break it off, it always breaks at the at the the leader knot. Yep, yep. Not with the every increase. every time, and then you got a then you got to have a whole new leader on. So the tip a friend taught me with that is make sure that your leader is make sure the depth of water you're fishing matches your leader. So if you get snagged, you can reel the the leader knot into your reel tip and pull. Because that automatically will make the weak point the hook. Mm. And I started doing it this year. And even though it's, you know, I, this is with an FG knot too, FG knot too. I'll I'll do that now because no matter what depth, because so like where we're drop shotting on this part of the river where it's like 20 foot deep and you're drop shotting smallmouth, you're going to, you're going to lose a ton of weights. Tungsten's overrated, by the way, unless you got sponsorship. Please sponsor me. So go with cheap lead. Are you talking about tungsten what? Did you drop shot weights? Drop shot weights. Drop shot weights? I never, yeah, I never used We had a very, very, um, educated individual come on this show, and as since we're talking about leader knots, and we're talking about the uni union, we're talking about fluorocarbon, and whatnot. Um, we have some comments on here that are just saying pretty much, uh, fuck using a leader, and we've, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. We've also had some pretty educated people come on here. Um, I think one of his David Fritz, David Fritz. Yeah, he does, he throws a David crankbait Fritz straight came braid. On the show period. And he just but. pretty much was like, "You think those fish are paying attention to your braid?" He says, "Unless you're throwing it in freaking mm-hmm. a pool where it's crystal clear, it's Dude, just not." I, I, yeah, I, I agree. And I, uh, I, I tend to agree myself. I don't. I think we lost. Sorry. The, the amount of times that I've caught fish on red braid back in the day before I knew what I was doing. I think the biggest issue with line it's not that they can see it it's how it affects the action of the bait yeah, yeah I, I agree with that but let's say in the vacuum about the action so many le- legit let's say kayak guys they use that because of the no stretch because they're in a kayak you set the hook you're moving forward all yep. those issues but they still catch a bunch of fish on a chatterbait and all these other yep. baits and so let's say it does negatively impact the action of the bait how badly is that? Is it a 2%, a 3%? Because I, I do think there are circumstances where it doesn't matter. Is it as negatively do. impacting your bait because your bait is a subsurface bait? I don't think it... Or because you don't have any stretch or any play in your line. Because um, personally, braid is a lot... It's, it's not personally. Braid is a lot more sensitive than fluorocarbon or mono. I don't really think it affects um, the action of moving baits that much. To be honest, I, I think it changes the vibration. So if you have does it change the vibration or does it change the vibration you can feel? <sighs> exactly. I mean, it, if we want to get super duper nerdy with this, everything as a conductor has a different uh, load, right? right? So different substances will have different vibration tendencies. So if you have braid with a lipless bait, does that actually increase the vibration through the water if it's telegraphing? the vibration of the bait through the line as it's being pulled through versus if you have mono, does that deaden it so that bait sneaks up on the fish a little bit more because it's not being telegraphed by the line. Okay, that, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I or that. I just smoked too much when I thought that up the other day. So it could be that as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, again, like, do we overanalyze it like I just did? Are they that intelligent? Mm. I, I think, no, I don't think they are. <laughs> I, you know what? I've it's seen so hard to stuff. say, man. Like, it's so hard to say because, like, like I said, like, there you see some fish do some stupid things and you see them do some intelligent things. But 
I just I go back to back in the day when I got into bass brain, fishing. I was throwing. Let's be honest, their brain their brain is mm-hmm. this big. Yep, slightly <laughs> yeah. bigger yeah. than yeah. mine. I was throwing shit into a dirty ass pond with red braid, direct tide, probably with just whatever the basic spin. What is the basic knot that every improved person, clinch? The, the clinch improved knot. clinch knot with braid, and uh. The amount of fish I caught just straight tied with red braid is just. This sounds like the ridiculous. origin story to your break offs this year. Possibly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I We're would, still in the learning thought process. I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I think people overthink line a lot. I mm-hmm. mean, granted, now it, you know, certain lines have more feel, more stretch. You know, so you get better hook sets, or you can feel more uh, like that. That kind of makes a difference, but I mean, I throw, I throw my spinner baits on seventeen or twenty. Yeah, like you Pound think the fluoro? Plant fluoro. You think like because I'm running twenty pound fluoro, the fish can see it in no. the super clear, you know, Potomac grass. Like n- nobody gives a shit. I do like, think it can, I do think it can affect no, your no. rate of fall and where the bait stays at in your water. Oh level. yeah, it'll. But, it'll, like, but other than that, if right. it's the Potomac fishing, rate of fall in three feet, yeah, like I'm fishing yeah. three foot or less of water, so I don't really care about. Right, it's like uh, that, that is. That, a, like, I mean, that's that's a very good point too. I mean, that's obviously your your line diameter is going to affect your bait depth, and ha- that goes mm-hmm. back to Which the also, line affecting action, I, I, but. I have to say, it brings me back to the whole braid thing, though, because your braid line diameter per strength, per tinsel strength, is... About, it's about yeah, 10%. Like you're, a, like, 15-pound braid is, like, the diameter of 6-pound fluoro. Something mm-hmm. like that, or something like yeah. that, 8-pound fluoro, you know what I mean? No, it's like, yeah, it's it's definitely, like, 6 or 4. Yeah. Uh, ten Like, 10 is, like, 4-ish. So, like... Ish. Is Ish. braid honestly uh, overlooked a lot? I I think I think it is. I think I it's think because it they marketed fluorocarbon for so long. It was a branding thing, no different than when people like push cigarettes back in the fifties. Like it was, they wanted to make fluorocarbon more of a thing. I think it has its place one hundred percent. But we can't also be like, yeah, this was something they could sell at a higher price than than, well, than the, braid. The other th- the other thing you have to look at too is not just action and hook sets is. That like I can I can t- like I fish buzz baits on fluorocarbon. You want to know why I fish buzz baits on fluorocarbon? Really? Because of how many times you pull the pull a buzz bait out of a fish's mouth with braid, because there is no stretch. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're you're pull. I mean, you'll pull it out, and that's I, I'll you know I'll be completely honest. Like I was, I always fished it on braid. I always missed a ton of fish. Watched a video, a Gerald Swindle video. Said, you know, fish, fish your buzz baits on 17 pound fluorocarbon, you miss less fish. Fish it up, started fishing on 17 pound fluorocarbon. I rarely miss a buzz bait fish. It's the same thing that I struggled with with frogs when I was younger was when you see the blow up, don't just step in the hole like you're swinging for a 400 footer. Uh, That's what I feel. Feel pressure. Every time. time. Feel them. And and then yank. Yeah. Like. (laughs) I'm trying to it, jack that thing. Oh, if he, if, if he bites a frog, he's either got it or he doesn't. Like, it's that simple. I'm Dude, not waiting for him I, to chew it. I will say, though, it has saved me so much where you feel for it. Because when they miss it, Jason. you can start working it again. And all, I've had them come back and hit it a second time. Versus if you just drop Ooh. and pivot, man, so, you miss that fish completely. Good comment, So Jim. Yeah, so Jim just said, you know, solve that with rod action. A softer rod, you, mm. you know, gives, you know, stretch the line. Well... You know, a softer rod also has less feel. A softer rod also uh, but do you doesn't really have need as much feel for top water. D- depending on, I'm just in general, in general solving right, with right, you right. know solving it with rod, the yeah. lack of stretch with rod action, less feel. Uh, what you less hook penetration. I mean, you know, oh, less, that's a big one. Let, we're we're talking about bad memories now. You know, so, if, you, if, you're going, fishing, you're, if, if you're fishing, if you're fishing a softer rod, on the softer rod, depend it all the. Situational, right? You know, depending on what you're fishing. Mm-hmm. If you're See what fishing, you're saying though. I yeah. like it. No, I totally, I totally get what you're saying. You know, it's like, 
Yeah, and it's like, how thick of a rod do you actually need? I mean, and, and honestly, when, when you think of like, like go with flipping sticks, you can go with a lighter flipping stick all the way up to freaking a baseball bat for like the California Delta. At some point, I feel like there's a diminishing rate of return. And if you have the right line and reel, you can have a subpar rod and still do something with it if you sat hard. And this is where it's like to each their own. If you're a stronger person that's 6'5", you probably don't need a broomstick flipping rod. You'll probably kill them a lot more than if you're maybe, you know, petite at five one i look so i, I look especially for flipping sticks i match i match the rod to the cover ver more than versus like a yeah set. i agree with that you know if i'm it, you know if i'm punching hydrilla mats well you know all, it's just on the potomac uh, you know i'm i have to bring a fish through you know a super thick hydrilla mat you know with 20 pounds of hydrilla hanging off of its head. Like, mm -hmm. I, I want to, I want a broomstick simply for pulling the fish out, not for setting the hook or it's just getting the fish out of there. That's just another, uh, you know, that's just another factor that you have to think about is the cover that you're fishing. Now, if I'm flipping, you know, if I'm flipping lay downs, I, like I don't need a broomstick, you know, seven, five, you know, seven, five heavy is probably the heaviest rod that I'm going to do. Most of the time I'm throwing like a seven, three medium heavy. If I'm flipping lay downs, you know, if I'm flipping, flipping I agree grass, with that. It's you know, you always got to match your rod to your what you're fishing. Yeah, both both my grass rods are extra heavy. So I have a seven six extra heavy, and I have seven nine extra heavy for purely for grass. Like for on the flats, August July when it's thick and you're I, punching. Yeah, that's what I have a I have a seven eleven heavy moderate fast that I use for punching mm -hmm. because you that that's another thing that people look at. To, you know, you like your your broomsticks. Like I want a rod with that has a little bend to it, so that mm -hmm. I'm not like you know ripping that fish's face off. When you I want it to hook. load. <laughs> yeah, I, I I want a little you know a little bit of bend because I I still need to you know until I get that fish you know you get that wad of you know hydrilla on their face like you still have to play that fish. And trying mm -hmm. to play a fish underneath of a mat is not the easiest thing in the world. Um, you know, if again, if it's a big one, if it's a you know, if it's a three pounder, I'm just dragging his ass out. But um, you know, I, I just like to have a little oh, a little give in a flipping in a punching rod anyway. We got a good comment here from John Haynes the uh, Fourth. I've got a question. I haven't done. I haven't done well at the Potomac pads across from the boat ramp, and I'm wondering if you guys do well there. He has a follow up. Uh, I got a really thick rod from Bass Pro. Uh, nothing shoots like a country mile. It's amazing. I have no idea what pad. What do you mean, like okay. small wood? Yeah, he, he's talking about small yeah, wood. Yeah, he's talking. He's talking about like Marsh Island. I don't think I've ever caught a fish in the pads on the Potomac ever. Really. I don't I've, think I've ever caught a fish out of pads on the Potomac. I have smashed them in the pads. Yeah, Did you guys I, I, touch I've on your them. favorite line for a leader? Oh, we got our red too. label. Period. Oh uh, no. In you, Vizax. You, you better you better you better step that up a little bit. In Vizax. Tattoo. Ooh. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, Sun Tattoo. Sunline. What was the name of it? Sunline just came out. FC with something. Sniper. No, they have leader material, straight yeah. shock absorbing leader material now. And I just bought some last month. Sunline. What the hell is it called? Tattoo. Oh. Tattoo is my go-to leader material. Tattoo's a tattoo. Good. I like my uh, if not Invisex. I, I use Invisex a lot too. Um, also, what was that other? It's a it's a sniper. FC. That's FC what it was. Sniper. FC sniper. FC is, Sunline leader. Uh, Sunline. Sunline. Yeah. Sunline. FC sniper. Sniper's good stuff. I don't think that's it. It's something else. I, didn't, I just, I like, I like Seaguar. So I stick with Seaguar. Yeah. It, For I think material, the material, fish tattoo yeah. because it's super abrasion resistant. It's super supple. And it, you know, if you're, yeah, is, <clears throat> is it expensive? Sure. Get it when it's on sale. It's $30 yeah. for 200 yards. 200, a 200 yard spool of leader material is going to last you two years. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you know you're spending thirty five dollars on your leader material for a year and a half to two years worth of leader material. And, and buying leader material, just for everyone listening, is completely different than just buying fluorocarbon. I I learned this the hard way. If you buy the leader, the fluorocarbon specifically made as leader material, it's more shock absorbent. It's built that yeah. way to handle snapping. So always make sure you pay that little extra. Whatever brand, if it's specific, if it's specifically made for leading material, it will be better uh, for you in the long run. I will say that for bass fishing, I don't. 
I, I don't specifically use, um, uh, you know, like leader material. Um, fly fishing, though, uh, I use Seaguar Blue Label, which is, mm. you know, specific. Um, I have used the gold, their gold label, too, which is their, you know, their other leader material. Uh, and it's definitely, there's definitely, you're right, there's definitely a difference. Yeah. If, if you're fishing like smallmouth and you're talking four, five, seven pound test, I think the lower you get the, if you're fishing 20 pound fluorocarbon as your leader, I think you can be a little bit cheaper than if you're fishing four pound test with smallmouth. You have to get more expensive crap, the more finesse you go. It's just every, every oh, yeah. system has to work to the nth degree to be able to land those fish when you actually hook a big one. I mean, yeah, 17 pound line, 17. I mean, it's 17 pound. Yeah. Line. Like I'm not, not too worried about a bass breaking it. Uh, unless it has a nick or I tied a bad knot, you know, mm -hmm. like for the most part, 17 pounds, not, you know, not breaking, um, 12 pound, you, you know, even down to like 12 pound, unless there's a nick or I, I tied a bad knot, it's not breaking. Um, unless, you know, you get wrapped around something, you know, grass and stuff like that. And there's always stuff that can cut it. But once you get into like the eights, like eight and below, like you really need a high quality line to use as a leader. 100% agree. And that can be uh, that can be a regular line. Like I said, I use Tatsu, yeah. but Tatsu is also a super, super high quality floor. Premium. Uh, but Invisex, Invisex has, has done well for me, too. Like I've 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 used Invisex for a long time as well. It's all I've been using yeah. for, uh, for, for years leader, now for, for a leader. leader material specifically. Yeah. And, and John, well, getting Vizex back to your uh, for my swim, I 20 pound uh yeah. Fluorocarbon and Visex is what I'm using to throw my big. I actually just switched to as well. I switched to Suffix this year because I get a pretty hefty discount, and that's been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would too. It's been it's been pretty. <laughs> uh, it, it's actually it's been you know it's been pretty good line. I'm I'm actually relatively impressed with it. Um, I feel like it doesn't um, last as weird. long as, um, Invisex. Like you don't. Um, it takes sun damage a, a lot a lot faster. Um, mm -hmm. so I, I do find myself changing, yeah, changing line a little more, a little, a little more often, not, not terribly though, but for no, that's good seven, 75 bucks for 1200 yards, you know, I can't really, yeah, you, dude, you can't, you can't beat that. <laughs> you can't. Like, uh, um, yeah. John, oh yeah, John. So lily pad question. Um, yeah. So are you from a, are you, I'm assuming you're fishing from a boat, not a kayak or whatever, but yeah, I would just say, depending on high tide versus low tide, how you fish the pads, I've always had a ton of success in pad fishing, but it is, you put a podcast in and you just start, you just start going to town on it. It can be very tedious at first until you kind of figure out the pattern. One key thing I would say, if you not fishing a tournament is to be quiet and still and just watch, especially like on the Potomac in the spring, they'll hit the pad stems and mm -hmm. it'll vibrate. And sometimes it's a snakehead, but other times it's a bass. And if you just sit there first thing in the morning and just watch the pad fields, you'll see which one's got more fish in it. And that can kind of help you get a little bit more confidence to stay there and just pound it. So I always keep my head on the swivel. Like if I'm back in, um, um, not, not Poet, got Belmont Bay, you know, there's a lot, there's pads on both sides of it. And I can sit there and while I'm flipping one, I'm looking around at others to see if I see any disturbances in there that can give you a clue to stay in there tighter, but finesse shit, dude, I've seen a lot of guys catch it on tiny tubes and stuff like that, flipping that in there. Um, and then it's just weight size. And I would say that there's no right answer. Sometimes a heavier weight, sometimes a lighter weight. It, it just depends. The one thing I'll say about a heavier weight and I've seen is it, you can be a lot more stealthy, I believe, with a one ounce weight because you can get it just there and thumb it and gently set it in and it'll go through anything and go straight into the water. A, a, a lighter weight, if it gets too light, you really got to coerce it to get it in there if you miss your flip between yeah. them. So experiment. I, I mean, I will I will say, you know, on the same lines, I, I don't go as heavy as as one ounce. Yeah. But I, yeah. I fish, if I'm fishing pads, I fish a lot of three eighths to half ounce, even, mm -hmm. even though I'm fishing, a, you know, a foot and a half of water. Um, good go in the spring. If you go in there in May when they're spawning in the pads, it'll give you a ton oh, of confidence yeah. to fish the pads. And they spawn in every single pad field that's in Mad Woman. So like you'll catch you'll you'll catch fish. It'll get you it gets you some confidence in in fishing mm -hmm. the pads. But outside it, of the it, springtime it, though, like it gets you know it's not it's not a year round thing for me. I mean, I've caught no, them in the pads no. in you know later in the year, but mostly it's a spawning thing, pre-spawn spawn. Pre -spawn spawn. It, 
it, it, there's more fish. There are fish in the pads year round, but there's definitely less uh, when it's not the springtime. And if you're in like a kayak, man, get as far back up in there as possible. There's always like one or two four pounders, but I think they get farther back up in there, especially if there's like a creek opening. Matt Owens, for example, you go way the hell in the back there where kayaks are. There's always people that catch massive snakeheads and then randomly catch like a six pound bass on a frog in, in the pads. Like there will be fish that push up there, but I just think there's they're resident. It's just like in Lake where you'll have a resident bluegill eater. I think there's a couple resident big dogs that will stay up there super shallow in the summer. But if you're in a 22 foot ranger, I just don't think you can get to them this time of year. It's just freaking impossible. Yeah. You got to go through um, the Amazon rainforest to get oh, home. Dude, it, it's, it's insane. Um, but they're there. Um, well, speaking of the Amazon rainforest kind of, so coming from Africa, how'd that mess up your, uh, your tournament season? Like how, how'd it go for you? So, um, <laughs> how did, how did it destroy your tournament season? The, uh, <laughs> I will tell you that there was a, there was a vast drop off in performance from pre. So I went to Germany in August and then I went to Morocco in September and there was a fairly large drop off in tournament success from before you that to after that. Um, so you know, I, the only, so I'm obviously a military. So the only, I don't get to fish a lot of tr like points trails locally, uh, just cause I miss so many tournaments. So I'm very fortunate to be in a really good club with a lot of good guys. And there's two of us that are in the service in the club and we will actually make sure that we schedule our weekend tournaments on days where nobody has to work for, for drill or whatever. Um, I got a ton of second place finishes. We fish a 10 tournament season. Um, I think I got second five times, won a tournament. Um, I got second in the club. Um, missed, a, I had a lot, like a lot of the tournaments where I came in second, I had a couple key fish that I lost that would have done it. Um, That's the only reason Dustin won this year, it's just because you missed time. That's it. Uh, no, I mean, yeah. Dustin definitely earned it. <laughs> Dustin definitely yeah, right. earned I'm just, it. I'm just messing around. Whatever. Yeah. Dustin's a scrub. Yeah, definitely. Dustin definitely <laughs> earned it. But, um, we, I put a lot of time into Conowingo this year. We fished the uh, the Conowingo Open Series. Me and my partner, we won the first one. We had a really nice largemouth bag, um, eighteen that, pounds. That raises my next question. You did, oh, done, though. You also, uh, you you had a very nice eighteen pound bag, eighteen and a half pound bag on the gunpowder. Yeah, which was pretty pretty impressive. That's a big bag out of the gunpowder. And you know what the That's thing of it is? Bag. Is I'll tell you both of those tournaments that I won with big bags. So, uh, well, the, the gunpowder was solo. The um, the other one was we were a team tournament, but it's a, a funny story about that. But anyway, you still caught all. <laughs> well, no, I, I caught no. Miles caught. Miles actually caught the key fish uh, in a different spot, but it was it was so hot and heavy that I basically told him I was like, I need you to sit in the back of the boat and figure out which fish we need to call next. Was it because, on a glide bait? No, uh, not even close. But anyway, um, so. <laughs> But that the Conowingo tournament, I'm very proud of that one because there's, I mean, I think that the first one, there was probably 46, 47 boats in it. Um, and those are a lot Hammers. of those guys that fish that lake exclusively Ham. fish that. They don't fish mm. anywhere else. So that was pretty cool to win that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was – then I went to – I had to go travel and things kind of changed. I finished my club season Saturday with uh, – I got second in that. I had the potential. I pulled up on a spot with 20 minutes left in the tournament, and I found a school, a wolf pack of smallmouth chewing. I caught two out of the school, and I missed about five or six of them. And two of the ones that I missed that I saw were over four pounds, jumping, wow. throwing my hook. I'm throwing the wrong rod. So, going, yeah, going, going back to our conversation about rod action, Let's throwing the wrong rod. rod. Action here. 100 throwing, I'm 100 percent throwing the wrong rod. We're, we're Let's getting, talk about your most insulting day of fishing ever. Let's get into it, dude. It was it was terrible. So I pull up at the spot. It's we weigh in at three o'clock. The spot <laughs> I'm fishing is close to the ramp. I pull up and I'm sitting on like six and a half pounds. Right, no, just a tough day. I, I'm looking around on the scope and I see him feeding. I see fish. Which is very interesting. They were act the fish were sitting on top of the school of bait. They were mm. that's because they were eating. Exactly. And I'm like, <laughs> this is about to happen. So I throw my little owner spin in there and I'm throwing it on a I have a Demiki rig rod. I could have sworn it was a six ten medium light. It was actually a six nine light. 
Throw my little, I'm throwing a little finesse underspin. Throw it in there. Hook Did up. you not feel it when you picked it up? Did it not feel a little different in the hand? Or I, I've then, been so, so here's the thing. I've been throwing this rod for a long time. With I this. will say that those rods do run a little stiff. So yeah. uh, it's an hard rod. He's been taking light steroids and testosterone pills for a long time now, <laughs> and he just can't. Their their light action rods are more like a medium light in like yeah. a Saint Croix or a Shimano. Mm -hmm. So uh, I pick up the rod and I I, I cast immediately get a bite like um, i don't even you can see the fish chewing bait so it's like you cast in there you're getting a bite throw my underspin in set the hook and the fish jumps about four pound smallmouth jumps off i'm like what the hell dude there's no way throw in there again was that another a, one next cast was that a four pounder or a tony four -pounder? no it was a four pounder i think <laughs> dude it sounded like a can it sounded like i dropped a rock in the water when it jumped out like when it landed back in the water, it had the big Speaking splash of sound. It, I just want to, I want to tell a funny story real quick. Go for it. I was fishing. I was fishing on the, story? I was fishing on the back channel one day and Tony had a club tournament <laughs> and Tony is so out of his mind, excited, telling me that he's got 18 pounds. I think I had like 14 or something. You had 12 and a half. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Didn't I still win the tournament though? No, Dustin did. No. <laughs> it's like twenty one. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't. Have he's done going crazy. Far. Like on the boat, we're both fishing the same grass bed, and he's like, "Dude, I've got like eighteen pounds. That was a five pounder." <laughs> and he, like, I get back and I'm like, "How'd you do?" Oh, uh, I dude, had, I had twelve and a half pounds. <laughs> I remember that. I actually do wow. remember that tournament. I actually do remember that tournament. But that was because I caught a five pounder right in front of everybody, and I was like, "Oh my god, it's a giant!" But anyway. No, um, no, this was a different one. That that one that was a legitimate five pounder. That was a, yeah, that was funny. And I didn't have a net either. I didn't have my net out, so I'm like holding this thing, you know, doing like ah, oh, I'm gonna grab them. Nets are um, nets are over. Yeah, nets just suck. Boat, just don't even flip them. Yeah, but flip them. so so. Long story short, I'm, I'm sitting on this school of fish, and I I'm literally like watching the minutes tick away as I'm missing good good smallmouth like three, four casts in a row, miss them. I finally catch like a three pounder. It was like, I was actually like two, six is what it weighed. Thank you for correcting that. Yes. So I catch one, <laughs> it's a decent one. Like I'm not even looking at the, I'm not even doing scientific calling. I have big side of the live well. Calling. I have big side of the live well. I have small side of the live well. I throw this fish in big side. I grab the first fish I could get my hands on, on small side and yeet him a football field away. <laughs> Because it's legitimately like 252 and I weigh in at three. Okay. And I have two minutes to get back to the ramp. So, <laughs> eat him. Uh, like, dude, it was literally it's like, like the like, beginning of the freaking your intro when your freaking girl just freaking <laughs> eats that fish like 78 yeah. feet in the air. Just send it. So, so I finally catch one. I, I'm looking for him again. I find him. I throw my owner spin back out. Set the hook on another one. Good one, dude. Like a real good one. It jumps off. I am jumping. I felt like a, a professional athlete. I think I that was probably the biggest vertical of my life. When that fish jumped like a dolphin and threw the hook, I jumped about seven feet high on my boat <laughs> and threw my hat on the deck. And I'm like, what the fuck's going on? Like, fuck. So, like, regained it, like, untangled my shit and threw back out there, caught another, like, two-pounder and ended up with eight and a half pounds. And I was like, God, dude, I, I could have had, you know, 15. Yeah. I lost 15 just in that spot. And I was like, God mm. damn it. So I ended up going out the next day. And, and beat on and beat the hell out of them. Oh, I mean, the, absolutely. The text stupid. messages in the group chat were all time. It was a revenge tour. It was 100% a revenge <laughs> tour. So, so now we've got we, Tony's already ordered. We, well, I got him. <clears throat> yeah, I went. I order, ordered another order rod some, the next day to order some longer rods. Yes, uh, because it is very hard to. It, it's a whole lot easier to keep fish on using a longer rod, uh, especially small mouth. I figured yeah. that out in New York. That mm -hmm. when I switched from a six ten drop shot rod to a seven three drop shot rod, my mm -hmm. landing percentage went up significantly. Mm -hmm. And if you're using a bait caster, go with the highest gear ratio oh, God yeah. has for you. Um, and if you can find a high speed spinning reel, that's, that's yeah. good too. Yeah. If you can if you can find one of those like six to one spinning reels, which mm -hmm. not too many people make them, they're all relatively low, but yeah. Just so you can take up line, but that longer rod will help you take up that line too. Yeah, that's and that's yeah. super key. Well, I think a lot of the problem is is until I started getting into bigger fish in the last couple of weeks, I was I was getting away with smaller fish, softer mouths of the fish, and I when I was 
and leaning just, on them, burning them in. All right, just burning <laughs> them in, and, and you know, you're not losing them, and the ones you lose, oh, whatever, it was little anyway. Then you get around some big bona fide river smallmouth that it's cold. Their mouths are tougher. They have harder teeth, you know, whatever. And I'm not getting the hook penetration. I noticed, and even in the flurry of that 20 minutes, I noticed every fit, the two fish that I did catch out of that school, the hooks were falling right out of their mouth. The, the I was like, damn, the, that's kind of weird. But at that point, I, I can't retie. The longer rod will help you. Yeah, you go to a yeah. lighter wire. Yeah. The, that's, so that's the thing. The underspin that I was throwing it's it's basically has a Ned Rig hook with an underspin. That's a huge clue, by the way, if anyone knows. Well, are you, are you taking a step back? What's that? So when you set the hook, are you just here? Or are you using your deck to your advantage and walking back? Oh, I'm just to, it, I, I honestly at that point, I couldn't tell you. Um, I now, can tell you normally Tony's all over his deck. Tony's usually. boat feels like it's going to flip over when he sets the hook. Usually. But now, so the cool thing is we it may went, have caused a tidal wave in, yeah. in China. When I went out yesterday. <laughs> I took a friend of mine and he actually he's into like filming and video editing. So he took a couple videos and on the same rod, I hook a really good smallmouth in the same spot from Saturday and I lost the fish. So I'm curious to see my hook set because it's on camera. I haven't watched the clip yet. I would say like that, that longer rod is really going to help you. Um, uh, that's and I figured that out when I was on Ontario uh, and, you know, you're you're fishing 25 feet. You know, it's you're catching fish in 25 to 35 feet of water. And they, when you hook them, they come straight up. Mm -hmm. Like they mm -hmm. immediately go to the surface and jump ev yeah. almost every time. And when I switched from my normal drop shot rod that I use around, you know, around here, which is 610 medium light to a 73 medium light, uh, my landing percentage, I mean, went a significant, I would say probably at least doubled. Wow. You're able to keep mm -hmm. that hook pen. Right, because you have so much more rod to work with. So exactly. when they come out of the water, you can you can mm -hmm. take up you can take up line with your rod faster than you can take up line by reeling. And when you're thinking yeah, about 100%. it too, I mean, what what I'm throwing, and like you just have so much swim. more leverage on them too when you're actually fighting them. And on that rod, I throw Demiki rigs and small swim baits. So like that's an actual hook set, not uh, just a reel down on them. So when you swing on a fish, I mean, you just you're picking you, up so much it, more line with that. You actually set better. the hook. Oh yeah, I don't set the hook on swim, swim baits. Well. Huh? Yeah, well, I mean, like I just lean into them. Well, so uh, it's it's a little yeah. bit of a hook set. It's not a, a like a, a big one, but it's you know it's a like a crankbait hook set. You know, kind it's of just, similar, it's similar. Into. Yeah, I mean, I I set the hook with a, if I'm throwing a small swim bait, I set the hook almost the same as I set the hook on a drop shot, except I'm setting it to the side instead of straight up. But that's what I mean. Like I'm, if I'm fishing it like this and he bites it, then it's just mm -hmm. kind of like a a nice little pull and crank. You know, yeah, but if you're, if you're doing that, hooks, yeah. I'm just leaning into it. I'm not really setting yeah. the hook. Yeah, no, I do the yeah. same. With, I do the same with small swim baits because usually, I mean, I'm using such a late wire hook on on swim baits. Well, this, and, this and that's the thing is the only way, that, the only reason you have to set the hook is if the hook diameter is so thick, like a jig, you have to actually punch them through. Right, Otherwise, right. yeah, you just have to lean back. And are did you say you were using a spinning setup for this or a bait caster spinning. setup? Because spinning, I would say BFS is your friend. You go you because then that. you can go to a 10 point gear ratio reel you can do like every company has a super fast and that can kind of make up for it too yeah um because again like it's so hard to find spinning i think wait didn't uh arba garcia have a spinning reel that's actually like a yeah they have a what, rebo rocket eight? spinning reel that's like yeah seven like, or eight to one that's the only one that makes a good one though which is stupid i think she um, has one now that's yeah, a it's little, probably it's a little faster but a hundred thousand dollars i wonder probably. if it's because no, it's of the, the well, it's probably because of the bail spinning so fast it may just be i think like if like i remember weird. right it's like i think it, i think they have one in like the van or something you know so a couple a couple hundred bucks i had yeah. to look for that but anyway yeah agreed i remember like seeing faster one. I real i just don't but yeah it's, it's interesting you talk about bfs because it's it's one thing like i watch all the tactical bashing videos and they talk about it. it's the coolest thing ever and like i have very extremely limited experience with, with bfs and it's like one of those things where it's like, you know, it's cool, but like, I, I don't know. Like, I, when I think of finesse fishing and Demiki rigs and small underspins, Ned rigs, like, I have to have a spinning rod in my hand. So I, I'm so open to it. I'm open to it, but it's like, I'm just not only. Sure. So the only two, I think, variables of why you'd want to do it is number one is controllability. If you are in close quarters stuff on like a spinning reel you can thumb it you can stop it so you can have pinpoint control so if you're fishing laydowns docks or whatever like if i'm doing a shaky head i can flip a lighter shaky head like right. with my bfs Bay setup i don't have to worry about it faster. you just you have yeah. a lot and more speed you can throw these when i throw underspins baits yeah 
boom, boom, boom. I boom. feel like I can't work the bait the same way. I, it depends on what bait you're using. Like if I'm throwing underspins with some spotted bass, like I can throw a my 10 Iowa that I have with that and I can make up ground a lot faster I, when they're I, I coming at me hard. Like a small swim bait, just like certain um, certain certain techniques. Like yeah. like you were talking about like a shaky head, shaky head drop shot. I, I've thrown those on like lighter bait casters and no, you know, no issues throwing them on there, but I feel like I just can't work the bait the same. For some reason, it be it. I don't know. It, yeah. It's probably just a mental thing. But here's here's the well, weird thing too is like I when I'm when I'm throwing a bait caster, I reel with my right hand, and when I'm throwing a spin rod, I reel with my left. So like kind of like to your yeah, point, I'm, when I'm finesse fishing, like all this is all this hand, and this, sometimes this hmm. is the only movement. Like with a Demiki rig or like hover strolling, you you know how it is. You just you're just barely shaking it. Like I'm never doing that with a bait caster. I mean, I can do it. With, I can do that. With I mean, I probably that. could, mm -hmm. but it's like. I don't know. It's like the mental aspect of it, I guess. Um, I probably huh. should try it. I, I'm I'm sure it's mental, but spy baits are another good one for it too. Now with um, BFS, do you yeah, still use? I've only ever thrown those on on spinning rods, but yeah. Now with BFC, that being a very good uh, a very good uh, technique to do on the on the whole BFS thing. With BFS, are you still going braid to leader, or is it just straight leader or straight fluorocarbon? Rather, I mean, it depends on the situation. A, a lot of times, I'll throw like I can throw. I have one that has like seven pound fluorocarbon that's super super like river smallmouth finesse i'm not doing that's just straight fluorocarbon that's gin clear super shallow water i can throw my top waters like my mega bass bfs popper i can throw little swim baits and i can pinpoint it i have another one <clears throat> that's braid that I'll, I'll put a little bit of a shock leader on if need be but I believe BFS just means it's just a finessier version. And so that could be an ultralight or that could be a shaky head on a medium-ish rod with 12 to 13 pound or 12 to 14 pound fluorocarbon. It's still technically BFS compared to what I would do it on. BFS is um, like, it's like weight, but it's like whatever the weight your bait is, but how many crankbaits and poppers and whatnot do you see in that? Finesse well, weight. it's getting you know, bigger. The smaller Rico is really hard. It's not easy to throw on a, a no, traditional it's not. No. Gentle. No. Don't, don't tell people about that. Baby. Everybody knows but about the Rico, Chad. It's yeah, not a secret. spoilers. I like it and it works for me. So I feel like I need to keep it a secret. <laughs> Rick Klun made that a, not a secret 25 years ago. <laughs> Glide baits yeah. suck. Don't throw them. They do suck. If, yeah, don't throw them. if you can't afford them, don't throw them. Cause they're addicting. I locked that in the last tournament of the year. Cause I had to catch like two fish to finish top 10. So I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to like, I want to lock these in and figure them out. And it's, it's a powerful tool, but I just do not know how you lock that in, how you incorporate that in a tournament, like arsenal, not a team that doesn't count, but like an individual, how do you incorporate it? Cause it's such a, it's a very win loss bite. thing. It's a very <laughs> specific bite and knowing when that window is to mm -hmm. apply I, that bait is the most important thing. And, or I think it's a good pre-fishing bait. It's good. You can go out and pre-fish. That's and the, if you get the followers and you get the, you know, you can kind of see, you can pinpoint where those fish are. Say you go and you're throwing on this point and you get five or six followers that follow that glide bait back. Okay. I know this fish on this point. I can come back here the next day. That's actually and where I've had the most success with a glide bait is not catching fish on it. Um, the last tournament I fished on Deep Creek. Sorry, that distracted me. <laughs> <laughs> the The last tournament I fished on Deep Creek, uh, I, I was throwing a glide bait and a mag draft around docks. And, like, I could just watch fish come out. And, all right, fish on that dock. Go to the next one. Mm-hmm. You know, you do the same, nothing on that one, nothing on, okay, mark this dock. And that's where I've had the most success in a tournament situation with glide baits and, and larger swim baits. So in a lake situation, you have to catch a kicker. Would you rather tie on a glide or a jig in 2024? Because I feel like yeah, it's jig. now a, really, jig. I feel like more people do the glide. I would do, I would jig. It, well, I, mean, I mean, it depends, I mean, that's, depending. I'm throwing a glide. You already know. <laughs> you know, it's, it's. It, you know, it, it's going to be situational, obviously, you know, based on time of year and, you know, are the fish shallow? Are they deep? Um, but really, like, I mean, if they're even if they're if they're shallow, I feel like I might lean more toward a fish will come up off the bottom and eat a glide. 
I yeah. feel like if I'm ledge <clears throat> fishing on Kentucky Lake, I'm I'm not gonna throw a glide bait. I'm throwing a, I'm throwing a three quarter ounce football jig. Well, now you're probably throwing a drop shot because that's apparently a smallmouth fishery now. It basically yeah, is. Jim says at the end of the day, throwing a big nine inch glide. You're looking for that one big fish to come in there, and the nine inch is big. The seven inch is kind of like definitely a happy for me. Yeah, I mean, you look at. Oh my because I've been fucking around with these too much. I mean, I think this one is a like a seven inch. This is the nine inch from uh, I think it's Fish Everything, just as an example. But uh-huh. I, I I don't know, man. Like the thing about these is, it, unlike a jig, you're not gonna the dink ratio the on a glide F- compared to a jig. The FE what? glide. I'm sorry, you're the Fish Everything glides are they're really good glides. They're phenomenal glides. They're hell. They they work very well. Dude makes a fantastic product. I, think, I mean, they're they're really good. Yeah, he makes a, he makes a very good product. But when he sends them to you, my God, it, it, the ratio though, <laughs> man. Like I, man, I don't know. I don't know. It's something I'm trying to figure out how I can incorporate it next year because I got destroyed and won a tournament where I would not drop it because I had a great practice and I just kept thinking like it'll work out eventually. And that's such a I don't know. You I think that's why so many people burn out. No, glide bait. I, I caught 18 pounds in practice. I'm like, well, fuck, man. Like, just bet the house. We got this thing. Well, and that did not work out. But, and so, that, I mean, you're, you that's, you run into that a lot in tournament fishing where, like, you, you can't get your mindset into what you did in practice. Mm-hmm. Practice for me is all about locating fish, not how I'm fishing. It gives me a general starting point, you know, but it's more about locating fish than it is, you know, about determining what bait I'm going to use. Perfect example, this last tournament, you know, that I fished, the tournament that I won on the Pokemoke. In four days, I caught four fish on a spinnerbait. Four days of practice, I caught four fish on a spinnerbait. Nine out of the ten fish I weighed in on a tournament, in the tournament, I caught on a spinnerbait. Because of the conditions, uh, you know, the conditions changed what I did. I was catching them. I was catching them cranking, uh, you know, in the uh, in practice. Uh, I caught them on a spinnerbait in the you know in the tournament. So you can't let the don't let you can't let practice, you know, give you a a one track mind on what you're going to do in the tournament. You know, the conditions That's were right to throw a spinnerbait, so I threw a spinnerbait. It, you know, if That's can, actually, uh... you know. And that's something we don't really get into is about like how important it is when I talk to like the upper echelon guys about not getting too dialed in in practice. Um, okay, but then I have the like I have other guys change. too. You know, there's so many yeah. things that, that the conditions change, fish move, you know, fish move up, fish pull off, uh, water level comes up, water level goes down. You know, all of those are going to affect. I mean, how you fish in a tournament, and you have to be prepared to make the necessary changes. Um, to adjust with whatever the prevailing conditions are for that day. Mm-hmm. It, it is. It's so true. And and I think it's the weird, do you, the classical fish for the win or just fish what's there? And it's so interesting because I think people will read that almost like the Bible and everyone has their own interpretation of what that means. Or to me, it's like, you got to just fish the pattern that's available. And if it means that you're catching... 33 pounders get that done first and then maybe make the pivot but just this neanderthalic lock a jig in for five bites like if you want to do that that's fine but you're probably not going to be very consistent it also it also depends on what you're fishing um and by that i mean are you fishing a jackpot tournament or are you you know fishing a trail where you need points because mm-hmm. if you're fishing a trail that you know you're you're looking at like an like our Chester County series up here, you know they you know you the top couple of teams will qualify for the Bassmaster you know the Bassmaster Team Championship. So points are kind of important there. You know it's not just about winning the tournament. You know if you can you know if you can catch you know 18, 18 pounds every tournament, you may not win any of those tournaments. You may not even get a check in any of those tournaments. But at the end of the year, you're going to end up pretty good in points. Um, so it's really, you have to look at what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. Are you trying to win angler of the year? Or are you trying to win a tournament? Uh, if you're just trying to win a tournament, if it's just a, you know, a Thursday night jackpot tournament, go for broke fish for the win every time. If you know, mm. uh, that you have a better chance of catching three big bites on a jig, go for it. 
because in, you know, say, you know, in our Thursday nighters over the summer, you know, if I get fourth place, if I'm consistent and I get fourth place 10 times, guess what? I didn't make any money. Mm -hmm. Same place, same mm -hmm. thing if I got 15th place in those tournaments. They only pay the top three spots. So fish the G, you know, fish the fish the stuff that's gonna give you get you the bigger bite. That's the issue too, is so much of fishing is around the gambling mentality of all or nothing. There's not a lot of trails that reward consistency. Yeah. No, absolutely. Because you don't get paid for you, your I feel like the, the point year. system is consistency though. The point system is consistency, oh, but what do you get for it? Oh. Yeah, a pat on the back. <laughs> right. right. Like, okay, so maybe like BFL. So, uh, you know, you you know, you know, want to be consistent because you want to make the regional. But on the other hand. consistently in third place, it's not enough for first place, though. What do you mean? If you're in third place every tournament, you're going to be doing pretty damn good. That's what I'm saying. But yeah. I, I, yeah. I've had guys that won AOY in the BFLs that almost made no money because they oh, didn't yeah. like cash it. Like they didn't like crack a win. And you have guys like they're like fifth in the points, sixth in the points. And they've won like $10,000 because they had like the bonus bucks and all that other crap from the one tournament they, they won. Right. Um, I it's mean, stupid. You, you know, think about it. If you have a, if you have a first and a 50th, that's the same as two twenty fifths. It's so fucked up. I mean, I hate it because I just think like in any other sport, the average thing, like if you're a baseball player and you go out there and you you are batting average is 100. I mean, that's you're not not making it work, but it incentivizes the guys that will just say like, hey, if I fish 30 tournaments with this thing, I just need one tournament to work. And that probably flips my bills for the year. Um, but you can't make the elite series with that mindset. Right. No, you know? because you have to be consistent. And yeah. that upper echelon, like you were saying earlier, that upper echelon is more about being consistent than it is, you know, about winning. You know, it's mm -hmm. your goal is to make the classic, right? If you're an elite series angler, your goal every year is to make the classic. Now, you, you can you can Scott Martin it and go win an open on your home body of water and then do nothing but fish for the win for the rest of the year because you know you already made the classic. You know, he didn't really care about the points. He was just trying to he was just trying to get a blue trophy. Did he requalify for the elites? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he was he was not great in the points, but like they He they, did they, enough. They, they they have an average it's like average. I don't know. They have a really it's so confusing. Only the people they have a really yeah. convoluted way of determining. It's so dumb. Um, like this is a bit like I know um, Carl Jakobsen, uh still it, it, he uh, got kicked off the elite series and requalified, but those two or three years that he was that he did bad on the elite series, you know, fifteen years ago, mm -hmm. uh, are still brought into his uh, average for staying qualified for the elites. Why wouldn't it be just be based on your year? Well, it's like, based on it's based on a career average. That's so weird. It's retarded. Yeah, but then weird. they'll <laughs> bring in random people and say, like, by the way, you won a classic or an AOI fifty years ago. You're allowed that in. Legends Come exemption. on in, right? It's Which is so fine. Stupid. Like I, I have no no problem with the legends ex exemption, but I think if you what if qualifies you, as a legend though, if you drop yeah. off the tour and you have to go through opens purgatory to qualify again, like you need you should get a fresh start. Like yes, just, I, I, just yeah. the same as any other person who qualified through that through the opens. Mm -hmm. You know, if I qualify I, through the if I fish the elite series like Carl did, like you know he fished you know fifteen years ago, he fished the elite series and then dropped out, and he had to go through the opens. And those same those other eight people that qualified, you know, get a fresh start going through. Like he should get. A, I agree he, with he that. He should get a fresh start too. Like if you, I, I you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. I think that should be changed. I think the legends thing is abused completely because in theory, if eventually you'll get to a point where everyone would in theory have a legends exemption. So therefore no one could get kicked so off. So I think um, like, if I remember they, correctly, that's abusive. Uh, if I remember correctly, you can only use the legends exemption for as many as you've won. So if you have say like, you know, Kevin Van Dam's won four classics, uh, and seven AOI. So essentially he has 11 legends exemptions. So he could fish 11 years under the legends exemption. 
um, you know, Rick Klund, same, you know, same thing. He had multiple legends exemptions. If you only have one, I believe you can only use it one time. Oh, we got Jacob. God, I love you, Chad. Thank you. Let's see. We've got legends exemption is if you win a classic AOI. Next one up is uh, you get a point two legends each year. They go to the highest bidder in those points. All right, there you go. Jake, that's confusing. Jacob and, <laughs> Jacob and his brother Wyatt are two of the guys I was mentioning earlier about the Elite 70 that had pretty good finishes. Uh, oh. Yep, two brothers that I fished with uh, at VMI when we did the college thing there. Those guys are, are serious contenders on the Elite 70. So we actually, yeah, we, me, we Jacob out. and I we fished for St. Lawrence this year for about a week straight. It was a ton of fun. Oh, okay. I see what he's saying now. So, okay, there's two legends. You get two, there's two legends exemptions that are allowed in each year. Okay. And then um, the highest bidder in those points would be the person who has the the most points. Um, hmm. and, and that's not necessarily true because they will select who they want. Uh, they, yeah, it's just uh, they make it complicated. So they're the only ones that understand what the hell's going on. It's kind of like the government. I mean, we have pretty much. We have, <laughs> right. I mean, we, have yeah. two, we have two new legends exemptions for 2025. So, you know, we'll yeah, see Rand, how that goes. Randy Howell and, and um, base. Yep. Mm -hmm. I if you leave, you shouldn't be in personally. If you leave because you want to go to another organization, let's say. Your employer shouldn't say, by the way, if you ever want to come back, we're going to let you in. If you're a baseball player and you retire, you don't automatically get to start for the World Series team right. because you go out of retirement. And I, I, I kind of they make these that. they make these things that make it less like a sport. They keep pushing these random shit that no other. You know it's like WWE, do. right? If My, their their futures in their past. They have to bring these old guys back once once a, on a blue moon to keep people interested. The, yeah. The Iconelli qualification was probably, and like, I, I don't agree with like everything that Mike does and, and all, but you know, he went out and did not use his legends exemption when he, when he dropped out of MLF, went back and requalified because he, you know, he, he specifically said like, I'm, I wanted to do it the right way. I didn't want to use the legends exemption. I wanted to come back. I wanted to mm -hmm. re-qualify to show that I belong here, mm -hmm. which was, you know, admirable, you know? Did he re-qualify the first year? Yeah, he was uh, he was second in the Northern Opens. Okay. But, but which really again, it, 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 even if it's just for the context of the business side of it, it, it makes him look better than a how where it's like, what the hell have you done? To where you just get to waltz in there and automatically get the keys back to the I'm house. Saying when, the same thing about Randy House specifically. As how I sit many here people after catching nine pounds yep, of like Randy club Hall, tournament? <laughs> so, Hang on, I'm not. But, I, I like Randy. I like I like Randy. I think so, he's good. I, I agree. A, I like the guy a, too. But from it's a like, business standpoint, like I want to watch Randy. Like I want to see Randy Howell on camera. If you take away the flat top, is he as cool? No, just saying. You know, he he's can he actually qualify again though? If he had to, probably not. I I don't think so. Not not with not with the competition that's in the opens. I think it's incredibly impressive that Cody Meyer and Dakota Ebert made it in there for now, and they're and they're both uh, Dakota Ebert more so than Cody Meyer. It, Dakota Ebert is an absolute monster. Like he, mm -hmm. he's he's ridiculous and just in how well he can catch fish. But you know, I thought it was really impressive that Cody Meyer you know, qualified his first time. Ish, you know, Ish has been fishing the Opens for two years. And, you know, he's actually done really, you know, done really well. I think he was 12th in points this year, um, which, you know, goes to show just like how good those guys are. Um, yeah. Because the, the Opens competition is is pretty insane. Uh, there's a lot of guys that fish the Opens that have nothing better to do than fish 300 plus days a year. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty crazy. Like you know, the amount, the amount of competition that you have there and knowing that like, you know, that ish can come in and, you know, he's 12th in points and, and he doesn't have a legends exemption to use. So like he, you know, that's his, that's his only route and he's more, which of a, again, you know, he's that traditional style angler. You know, he's not super proficient with, with forward facing sonar. He's gotten a lot better with it. Um, but you can, you know, you can see that he's working on, you know, becoming a better angler to requalify because you have to, and that's how a sport should work. And Absolutely. and I get like every now and then you should have an exemption, a Rick Klon or whatever. Like we can throw a couple of exemptions, but 
the the fact is when some of these people that had an exemption it wasn't because of medical it wasn't because of life it was because of we decided to go to a different team and the i just don't control. like the optics yeah. of that exactly exactly and you know what if you requalify more power to you but if it is a situation where you just give it handed back to you where that how does that not piss guys off how does that not show that like the only way that you get to be in this pool is if you're already marketable and, you and know I, if you are a scott uh, martin or whatever I, randy howe i'm i'm a little i i feel more that way with him than cliff pace like like i mm -hmm. if cliff you know cliff pace fish fished all nine opens for two years okay so like he you know he did he requalify no but like at least he made the effort right mm -hmm. okay so allowing you to use your legends exemption okay I can, I'm a little more amicable to that that versus the Randy Howe who fished three opens last year and, you know, now gets to come back in. It, it, what does it say, though, about how it's structured where it's like people that couldn't potentially qualify to get into the elites, but once they're in, they can be good enough to stay in the points. It's almost like maybe like they can be good the, enough to win Angler of the Year. Maybe it's the fact yeah. that the opens actually is better competition than the Elite Series itself. Probably is. Well, the, the opens is also a totally different animal too. I mean, it's a totally different. You, you're you're fishing against local hammers. I mean, I think. Well, you're also you're. It's a two hundred and fifty boat field versus you know yeah. versus a hundred boat field. You know that that changes how you fish a lake immensely. Yeah. Because you know what you you know that if so you completely find completely different pressure. Well, so first of all, you, they have more practice. So the, the lake gets beat up. There's 250 boats on the lake versus 100, which is beating the fish up more. And you know that if there's 250 boats in a tournament, you're you you're not finding that secret spot. Somebody else yeah. is finding that shit. No matter where you go, you're gonna have somebody with you, essentially. Right. You're gonna be you're gonna end yeah. up sharing you know sharing water, and that's just the way it is. Like that's that's how the opens fish, and it's you know that's that's a way tougher yeah and you, i've heard this you know a hundred times from guys that qualified through the opens you know with them asking like you know which which is harder you know and you know they'll they'll tell you that it's not that the competition is more experienced or better they're better fishermen because they'll tell you the opposite you know the better fishermen are on the elite series but it, it's a totally different style of fishing you know and, and that hmm. makes it harder I don't know. I, I think the thing with the opens is you have an on like player player 12, right? Is the locals because any local can jump in any open at any time and absolutely ruin your day. I mean, the, there's a wait list and it's yes, the, the wait list and the wait list is always prioritized to the people who are fishing. Sure. Uh, you know, the multiple tournaments, if they're fishing an entire division or they're fishing all nine. But my point is, is, for an elite ser elite series event on the upper bay, it usually doesn't take twenty pounds a day to win. No, a one day tournament on the upper bay is going to take twenty two to twenty three pounds to oh, win. Yeah. So, like local guys are able to come into elite or open series tournaments and steal, let's say, let's say two of the top ten spots, right? Because that's usually about sure. what it is, two or three. So yeah, they're not even was, fishing. Who did we have last year? Uh, there or the other year? Um, was there, there was Duke. And Pete, I think, were the only two locals. Did they and did they fish the rest of the opens? Uh, I know if Pete did. Duke didn't. Okay, so that's one. Sp and, and this is not a shot on Duke at all, but that's one spot that is bumping everybody else that's fishing all the opens down because you know you got some a local who's going to come in. No, I can win some money doing this. I can you know say I may have had a chance to win an open, and it's great. And I think you should do that because you have every right to do it. But for the guys that are fishing all over the place, that to me, like that's that would be my the biggest monkey on my back if I was fishing a major tour like that, like the opens, is that guy that's coming in who doesn't really care about the points, and I'm just here to win this tournament, and I know I can catch twenty two, I can catch twenty pounds, and the rest of you guys that are going to be here this week, gone next week, are going to be happy with sixteen, seventeen. Like I think that's the I think that makes a huge difference, and even if the locals are, are placed in twentieth. Right, that's still pushing everybody else back. It pushes them back one point, but it, it compounds. I mean, it, it goes along. It go, I think I think that's like the 
the weight factor between the elite series and the um and the and the opens in my opinion the, and the main difference between the competition the competition level is um I heard Logan Parks was talking about this the other day uh, that you know the biggest need to reach back out to him we do yeah. I like him definitely um the you know the biggest thing that he noticed is it doesn't matter how bad of a practice or how bad of a first day you had the other guys there absolutely hammered them because they uh he said scott martin told him in he was in way in line once uh at uh murray he had a bad day at murray and scott martin said these guys will catch everything that swims in that lake Mm -hmm. you know there isn't you know, there. If you have a bad day, the other ninety nine people did not. Mm-hmm. It, look at um, the St. Lawrence. You know, it was. You know, one one Bernie Schultz had a bad day. You know, uh, whether he didn't make it in or you know whatever happened, but you know everybody else had you know twenty pounds plus. Mm-hmm. Or, <laughs> you know, it's so there. Yeah. You know, it's. <laughs> It's not that you're never going to have that like, well, well, you know, it was just a bad day out here. Everybody had a bad day. Like, no, somebody's, you know, somebody's catching whatever it takes to win a tournament on that body of water. Yeah. So good stuff, guys. So we got to get through a couple of chats here. And no, probably people actually have day jobs. I have to like, get up tomorrow. Uh, we got Spencer Morley on Instagram. He says, what your go? What is your go to all around to get it done? setup? what's your favorite setup? Just Swiss Army knife. 7-1, medium heavy, 7-1 gear ratio, Daiwa Tatula, uh, SVTW. Uh, that's going to be on a St. Croix Legend Tournament. 17-pound fluorocarbon. That's my that's my do-everything rod. I would do, for for just the average guy that's going to go out there, I'm saying the 7-3 medium heavy Dobbins Fury Series with either a 150 Corrado or a 150 Tatula and a 6-8 gear ratio. Mm. I'll go with spinning because I'm usually fishing around smallmouth too. For me, it's a 7-foot medium spinning rod, um, either the Ardent Edge, which are increasingly harder and harder to find because I don't think they make as many of them anymore. Dobbins Fury is a good option. Um, Corrado... Or Shimano Corrado rod is fantastic, um, but and then a, like a six five to one or anything over six to one spinning reel gear ratio, ten pound leader and then up to twelve or sorry ten pound braid and then either ten to twelve leader unless you have a specific reason to go smaller that covers your drop shots. You can drop shot with it, not ideal, but you can finesse swim baits. You can do that wacky rigs if you're skipping docks. Uh, little bottom baits, small jigs, or uh, just, you know, a 16th ounce Texas rig. You can throw a Ned rig on that, too. I mean, you can do a lot of different mm-hmm. things with that rod. If we're going to go back to line, I'm probably going to go to maybe a 15 or a 20-pound braid because I feel like you could do a bunch of different things with that. Yeah. Fair. It might be a little light to go straight to it, I would but, go yeah, 30, I mean, there's... 30 to 40, but, yeah. Yeah. Maybe I get a little claustrophobic. I feel like if snap, like, but... top water, maybe, but, like, a crankbait or something, I feel like I would want to use... If I'm if I'm getting into crankbaits, like I, I would stick with fluorocarbon. That's a whole other rabbit hole yeah, that we could spend two hours on. Yeah. Yeah, uh, true. I mean, I can't. Jack Ass Basson says, "What qualifies as the upper bay?" Uh, because you were damn near in the Atlantic Ocean where you were fishing last weekend. Bay Bridge North. Okay. Oh, I'd say Bush River North. Yeah. I'd say Bay, Bay Bridge North. Gunpowder like the Bay, below like to the me Chesapeake Bay Bridge. Bay. Yeah, Chesapeake Bay Bridge. Ever Chester Chester River Chester River North. Really? Yeah. Wait, Chesapeake Bay Bridge. That's dude. That's the whole damn bay. This is what I'm saying. That's. You mean Norfolk Chesapeake Bay Bridge? No, 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 no. no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Annapolis, 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 Maryland. That's why when people ask you where you're fishing at, and you tell them the Upper Bay, it's just the best thing to tell them. But, but to be <laughs> fair, when you say Upper in this in this area amongst this you know regional anglers, when you say Upper Bay, ninety percent of the time people are talking about the flats. Yeah. If they say Upper mm. Bay, they're talking the flats. If they're not, they'll tell you this river, this river, this river. Yeah, because the, I mean the bay itself doesn't doesn't play it's you know once you get right. once you get below uh turkey point it's it's, it's no longer it's, river it's no longer fishing. the bay it's just you know whatever individual river you're in so yeah i can agree with that but for the most part like if i was 
if you were having a tournament on the upper bay, your limit would be the Bay Bridge. Yeah. We got, let's see. Taylor073 says, how is the bay fishing right now? In, insane. Lee bad or good? Great. Fantastic. Um, a friend of, friend of mine was out Saturday. Uh, they, <laughs> I think they call it 30. I think they call it 35. Thanks for joining, Jim. Um, they call 30, like 35 fish in, you know, eight hours and had yeah, like 18, 19 pounds. Mm. That's insane. Again, why don't they have more super tournaments up there? That'd be awesome. It, yeah. I mean, do you get into like late October, late October, early November? I mean, it's it's going to take a lot <laughs> to win a team tournament up here right now. Um, I think uh, last weekend it was 22 or 20, 21.35, I think, to win. Uh, That's second, insane. Second also had 21. It fishes really good in the fall up here. Dude, that's freaking awesome. Um, guys, I think we're actually all caught up on everything. Again, it would be, um, uh, let's see, head Jim, again, great show tonight, DMV, and thanks, BBR, great as always. I appreciate that. And then the last question of the night, because I'm going to cap it off, is going to be, uh, B-Cal, uh, if you could only fish one bait, what would it be? Oh, Jesus. Mm. One bait, if we're talking all, you know, year, year round, chatterbait. It's a good, yeah. I, for me, it's a drop shot. Crankbait, drop shot. Our key style head jig. A what style? Uh, the the old school style. I think it's called our yeah, key yeah, style yeah. head. Yeah, um, jigs, because jigs I can swim one, it, but or just regularly do it. I mean, I love throwing a jig, but so chatterbait year round. That's yeah. what you would use chatterbait. Yeah, I mean, I've called I've called fish on chatterbait in forty five degree water. So I would. I mean, uh, anything. I won't be able to drag something. Anything 45, 45 degrees. I would much rather throw a moving bait than. I love throwing a jig, and yeah, Chad knows I love throwing a jig. Oh yeah, that's but, what I was honestly dumbfounded. You didn't say jig. Uh, so. but you know, for as far as consistency, like the problem with a jig is I don't catch as many fish on a jig in the summertime. Yeah. Where I, I can catch Swim fish on, I can catch fish on a chatterbait year round. <sighs> Yeah, I just feel like a jig allows you, you can drag it on the bottom, you can swim it, you can fish it as a top water bait, you can smash it through cover, you can fish it on the bottom. Yeah, it's very, it's very, it's, um, you know, jig super, I love throwing a jig. It's not my favorite bait, though, yeah. but like. I honestly feel like a jig is a very. It's actually, it's probably my, it's probably bait, my number, like, it's probably my number two bait. Like as far as like, if we're probably. talking favorite baits, yeah. like it, yeah. you know, it goes buzz bait jig. Like dude, a Z-Man mushroom freaking like quarter or 16 well, it's like a 16th ounce jig or whatever it is. oh those like little ones yeah one of those little tiny i will never jig, but like, you mean a ned rig yeah, yeah. That's, that's the, the ned rig jig. you're throwing that's a ned, a ned rig. rig you're throwing a ned no. rig with a skirt i will the dock. i will never i will never they ever get bit ever say that i that's know fine. you say no. that but they i've thrown them bit. one time and whacked them on it it's like saying i thought you only throw a glide bait yeah i there's a two point i just understand that glide bait is not practical all the time so you have two rods, a broomstick, and an ultralight? Yes. <laughs> they cover both ends of the spectrum. Hey, if they don't want it small, they want it big. We we told Chad to start throwing jigs, and oh, then we found the jig that he was throwing. And You're like, yeah, was like, everyone but that one. <laughs> it was like the <laughs> smallest. It was the uh, the missile... <laughs> The missile micro jigs. <laughs> I was wrecking fish on them. I was wrecking fish on them. I was like, like that's not what we... on, I was like, smoked them on a jig today. He's like, oh, what do you throw? And I was like, the missile micro. And Paul's like, like that's what not the what... fuck is that? Like, like, that's, not, that's not what we meant by throw a jig. <laughs> I caught 30 crappy today, man. I killed it. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, guys, yeah, no, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, we covered everything. Um, you got anything got coming up that we could plug for you? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so November 2nd, uh, my club river rats, uh, we have our fall open on the upper bay out of tidings. Uh, if you want any more information, you can find us on Facebook, shoot us a message and, um, we'll get that out to you. So it's November 2nd. Awesome stuff, tidings, guys. Tidings on the upper bay. 
Um, and I will figure, I'll get a link from them guys to that club. So if you guys want to go check out their club and get signed up and anything, you can do that. Uh, I'm going to work through the night. If you guys didn't catch this live stream, don't worry. If you can't find it, I'm taking it down, polishing up the audio, and I'm sending it out there on Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, and YouTube tomorrow morning. Uh, check us out on Patreon, guys. The Patreon Fishing Tournament is winding down, and we're going to be talking about our next big event that we're doing, including the um, the... DWR, Maryland, is going to be doing a charity tournament for their bass raising program. I think it's going to be out of Dundee. Dates are not hmm. set, but I should have those by late November. But it's a bureaucracy, so who the hell knows when they're going to figure it out. But it's happening next year, allegedly. So, uh, as always, fun. Yeah. I'll be there. Yeah, more to come to that. Uh, anyway, like and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. See you guys. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.